Now, an investigation of marine mammals held in captivity. This hearing comes about two months after a killer whale at SeaWorld in Orlando attacked and killed its trainer. This Natural Resources Subcommittee on Oceans and Wildlife hearing is about two hours and 40 minutes. Good morning, everyone. The oversight hearing by the Subcommittee on Insular Affairs, Oceans and Wildlife will now come to order. Today's hearing will explore the issues surrounding the education and the conservation value of holding marine mammals in captivity. As everyone here well knows, this topic is not without controversy and can be become very emotional for some. That controversy and emotion is highlighted and made worse when there are incidents such as the February 24th death of Dawn Branchu, a SeaWorld trainer during an orca show at the Shamu Stadium. This tragic incident highlights the potential hazards of working with marine mammals in captivity. And I would like to take a moment to express my deepest sympathies to the family, the friends, and the coworkers, some of whom are joining us here today of Ms. Branchu for her loss. The incident also underscores the fact that despite what many people may think, orcas, dolphins, and seals are wild and potentially dangerous animals. These factors must be considered when developing the standards to evaluate and guide the implementation of education and conservation programs at public display facilities. The 1994 amendments to the Marine Mammal Protection Act delegated primary authority for the care of captive marine mammals to the Animal Plant Health Inspection Service under the Animal Welfare Act. However, the National Marine Fisheries Service, or the NFS, maintained responsibility for issuing permits for the take or the import of some marine mammals for public display. To obtain a permit, a public display facility must be registered under the Animal Welfare Act. It must be regularly open to the public and must offer an education or conservation program based upon professionally recognized standards of the public display community. In the 16 years that have since elapsed since these changes to the law, however, NMFS has not developed the regulations that would spell out their criteria for issuing such permits, for regulating the sale, export, or transfer of marine mammals, and for modifying, suspending, or revoking a take or import permit. In addition, the agency apparently has no process for ongoing evaluation of education and conservation programs at public display facilities to ensure that they are meeting the professional standards that the industry has established. Today, we will hear testimony from a variety of experts regarding this long-delayed rulemaking and explore from a number of perspectives current professionally recognized standards for education and conservation programs at public display facilities, as well as the process for evaluating whether these standards are being met. Over 60 million people a year see and experience marine mammals at aquarium, zoos, and other venues. For some, it is their primary source of information about these iconic creatures, their life history, and the, the many threats that they face. In light of that, it is imperative that we ensure that conservation and education programs at all captive display facilities meet the highest professional standards. So I look forward this morning to hearing from today's witnesses. And I now would like to recognize the ranking member of this subcommittee, the gentleman from South Carolina, Mr. Brown. Thank you, Madam Chair, and good morning to all. The focus of today's oversight hearing is conservation and education programs of facilities holding marine mammals. In order to receive a permit to display marine mammals, facilities are required to have conservation and education programs that adhere to industry standards. These standards were published in the Federal Register in October of 1994 and guides facilities on how to implement conservation education programs for the visiting public. 
What some people, what some people may not know, however, is that these standards are fluid and have evolved over the years to meet new conservation needs and education requirements. While I understand there are people who do not support the display of marine mammals or any animals in zoos or aquariums, the activity sponsored by these facilities, such as research and educational programs, animal husbandry, breeding and rescue and rehabilitation, are all important components to the conservation of marine mammals and other endangered animals. The rescue and rehabilitation programs run by these facilities are crucial to the survival of, str of stranded animals and participating institutions run many of the rehab programs using their own funds. These facilities also play an invaluable role for the general public since it may be the only place for many Americans to view marine mammals and learn about the conservation needs of the animals. Conservation and education programs for these facilities can help generate the general public's goodwill towards marine mammals and create support for conservation and management measures for these and many other marine species in the wild. Madam Chair, there are two aquariums in my congressional district, one in Charleston and one in Myrtle Beach. Both of these aquariums have hosted and educated millions of guests and have likely inspired the next generation of veterinarians and marine biologists. The South Carolina Aquariums in Charleston also has a sea turtle hospital where guests can see injured sea turtles being rehabilitated back to health. Other aquariums, aquatic theme parks, and dolphin encounter programs across the nation have inspired the same level of inspiration in future generations as well as become a strong partner in the international conservation community, all the while providing a strong source of employment for American tourist, tourism industry. Madam Chair, I would like to submit a number of letters for the record, including one from the Association of Zoos and Aquariums, the U.S. Chamber of Commerce, the U.S. Travel Association, and the International Association of Amusement Parks and Attractions. Thank you, Madam Chair, and I look forward to hearing from our witnesses today, and I yield back. We got. Where are they? Okay. Okay. All right. At this time, I'd like to um, recognize um, the gentleman from Michigan. I think he has a uh, statement to make for the record. Uh, I'd like to recognize Mr. Kildee. Thank you, my Madam Chair. Uh, Michigan, um, somewhat like Guam, uh, Guam is an island. Uh, surrounded by water. Michigan is a uh, peninsula, which means almost an island. And uh, we are all close to the water in Michigan, as you are close to the water in Guam. And we have in Saginaw a children's zoo, which is um, uh, accredited by the Association of Zoos and Aquariums. We try to keep the highest standards on that, but I think it's constant that we continue to look at the uh, the more we know about how we should uh, uh, have these facilities uh, available to the people, uh, better for us. So I appreciate very much uh, the hearing you're having today, and I ask unanimous consent that my entire remarks be placed in the record. Hearing no objection, so ordered. And I'd also like to... Uh, recognize the statements of the ranking member or the letters that he is submitting to the committee. Uh, hearing no objection, so approved. And again, uh, yes. And I'd like to also recognize Mr. Whitman from Virginia, the gentleman from Virginia. Do you have any statement now or do you wait until, yes. Thank you very much. I wanna thank both of you for being here and of course the ranking member as well. And now, um, I'd like to uh, recognize um, one of our colleagues, Mr. Alan Grayson from the 8th District of Florida to testify as a, a member of the first panel. So Mr. Grayson, you are recognized. Please proceed. Thank you, Madam Chair, and thank you, members of the committee. I want to extend my sincere thanks to the Subcommittee on Insular Affairs, Oceans, and Wildlife for allowing me to testify before this esteemed committee of my peers. I'm proud to represent Florida's 8th Congressional District. Central Florida is home to world-renowned zoos, aquariums, and amusement parks. SeaWorld is a shining jewel among them. I'm pleased that Julie Scardina, SeaWorld and Busch Gardens Animal Ambassador, 
is here today to share information about the wonderful conservation and education programs offered by SeaWorld Parks. The economic impact of SeaWorld Parks and Entertainment in the state of Florida is tremendous. SeaWorld Orlando alone attracts nearly 6 million visitors each year, including uh, my five children. The company is headquartered in Orlando, and in addition to SeaWorld Orlando, owns and operates five other parks in Florida, Discovery Cove and Aquatica in Orlando, Busch Gardens Tampa Bay, and Adventure Island in Tampa. Combined, the parks employ nearly 10,000 people in Florida. SeaWorld also plays an important role in marine science education for Florida schools. For 30 years, the park has partnered with Orange County Schools. This partnership has provided opportunities for students to participate in educational field trips to SeaWorld, including, again, my five children. It also brings instructors and resources directly to school classrooms. According to Orange County Public School Administrators, SeaWorld's educational programs even enhance student performance on science standardized tests. SeaWorld offers students an important opportunity to connect with marine wildlife in meaningful ways. Let me offer just one example. For the past 10 years, SeaWorld has partnered with the Fern Creek Elementary School in my district. At Fern Creek, 83% of the students are on free or reduced lunch program, and 20% are from time to time homeless. Needless to say, it is unusual for these students to get an opportunity to see marine mammals in any setting. SeaWorld hosted graduating fifth grade Fern Creek students at a sleepover at the park. The overnight field trip, which included educational sessions regarding marine mammals and the marine environment, offered these students a chance to connect with these animals in meaningful, memorable ways. I would be remiss if I didn't also mention SeaWorld's rescue and rehabilitation efforts. SeaWorld is a world leader in rescuing, rehabilitating, and releasing sick and injured marine mammals. When they receive a call about a sick or injured marine mammal, a team of SeaWorld animal care experts immediately deploy. They're available 24 hours a day, seven days a week, 365 days a year. This assistance is provided at no cost to the government or the community. SeaWorld's goal in rescuing these animals is to return them to the wild. However, in cases where the health of a particular animal makes that impossible, SeaWorld sometimes becomes a permanent home for them. These animals become ambassadors for the species, helping park visitors learn about the plight of these animals in the wild, learn about conservation issues, and learn about ways to help. I want to thank SeaWorld and Mrs. Gardena for all that SeaWorld Parks and Entertainment does to help both children and adults appreciate the need for environmental conservation. Finally, I'd like to commend Chair Chairwoman Bordello and the subcommittee and all its members for drawing attention to this important issue. Thank you very much. I thank the uh, gentleman from the 8th District of Florida for testifying this morning, uh, Mr. Alan Grayson. Thank you very much. You. We appreciate it. And now I'd like to uh, recognize a member of our subcommittee, Mr. Whitman from Virginia. I understand you have an opening statement. Yes, just, just very briefly, and it'll, it'll uh, dovetail nicely with uh, Representative Grayson's remarks. I want to thank you, Madam Chairwoman, for holding today's hearing. I think it's clear from what we see and hear from folks that our zoos and aquaria across the country are very effective in helping people gain a better understanding and appreciation of marine mammals. And that's especially important these days, especially with some of the challenges they face around the world. We're particularly happy to have today with us Julie Scardina, who will highlight SeaWorld and Bush Gardens conservation and education efforts, as Mr. Grayson so eloquently stated. Uh, they do have a significant presence uh, around the United States. In fact, in my district, uh, they employ over 3,000 people. And of course, the elements that they bring to the table as far as education programs and highlighting the efforts that go into uh, helping our marine mammal species is, is, is admirable. We know that they provide lots of opportunities for school children to make sure that they have learning experiences they, that they would not otherwise have and make sure that those children that don't otherwise live uh, in areas where they may have this exposure to issues surrounding marine mammals can actually uh, learn more, can understand and actually experience uh, those uh, areas where they can understand more about what's very important in this whole issue surrounding our marine mammals. So, Madam Chairwoman, I really appreciate you taking the time uh, to highlight in today's hearing the importance of the issues surrounding our marine mammals along a number of different levels and making sure we put into perspective those efforts out there to educate 
our youth and also other members of our population as to the importance marine mammals play in our ecosystems and the things that we need to be doing as decision makers to make sure we're looking out after the best interests of our marine mammals, but also making sure that we broaden the understanding that people have of what an important part they play in the total marine ecosystem. So thank you again for your leadership in, the, in today's hearing. I thank the gentleman from Virginia, my colleague, Mr. Whitman. Thank you for your opening statement. And now I'd like to introduce the first panel, if they would come up to the table as I announce them. Mr. Eric Schwab, Assistant Administrator for NOAA's Fisheries Service, National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration. Secondly, Dr. Lori Marino, Senior Lecturer, Neuroscience and Behavioral Biology Program, Emory University. The third witness, Dr. Peter Cochran, Visiting Fellow, Bioacoustics Research Program, Cornell Lab of Orth Ornithology. Dr. Paul Boyle, Senior Vice President for Conservation and Education Association of Zoos and Aquariums. I would like to thank all of our witnesses on the, the second panel for being here today. And as we begin, I would note that the red timing light on the table will indicate when five minutes have passed and your time has concluded. We would very much appreciate your cooperation in complying with these limits. But be assured that your full written statement will be submitted for the hearing record. And now, Mr. Schwab, welcome back to the subcommittee. And please begin your testimony. Madam Chairwoman, members of the committee, thank you for the opportunity to testify before you today on marine mammals in captivity. My name is Eric Schwab. I am the Assistant Administrator for Fisheries at NOAA. Under the Marine Mammal Protection Act, NOAA has jurisdiction over whales, dolphins, seals, and sea lions. Our mission is to ensure that marine mammal species and stocks can recover to or be maintained at levels that ensure they continue to act as significant functioning elements of the ecosystem. We conduct population assessments and research to identify and evaluate factors that affect marine mammal stocks in the wild and use that information to regulate the, quote, take of marine mammals. Our marine mammal conservation and management activities are widespread and primarily pertain to protecting and restoring these animals and their populations in the wild. For example, we oversee the Marine Mammal Health and Stranding Response Program. We develop take reduction teams and plans to reduce marine mammal bycatch in commercial fisheries. Uh, we research and mitigate the impacts of vessel traffic and ocean noise on marine mammals, mitigate and monitor impacts of oil and gas activities and alternative energy exploration, and work under international treaties and agreements to protect marine mammal species outside of U.S. waters. We also enforce the Act's moratorium on the take of marine mammals and permit take for specific activities. And while the majority of permits we issue are for scientific research on marine mammals in the wild, we may also issue permits for the removal of marine mammals from the wild or the import into the United States for public display purposes. Since 1999, I will note, all of these public display permits have been for the importation of marine mammals in the U.S., as there has not been a request for take of a wild marine mammal for public display purposes in more than 20 years. Our responsibility with respect to public display is to ensure that stocks and species in the wild are not adversely affected by removals from wild populations, that takes are conducted humanely, and that those who apply for permits to import or take animals from the wild meet three statutory criteria set forth in the Act. These include they must offer a program for education or conservation purposes that is based on professionally recognized standards of the public display community. They are registered or hold a license under the Animal Welfare Act and maintain facilities that are open to the public on a regular schedule basis with access that is not limited other than by charging and admission fee. Once a public display facility meets these criteria and has legally obtained and is maintaining a marine mammal at the facility, we have no authority to provide oversight over the holding, breeding, or care of the animal. As the 1994 amendments placed those responsibilities solely within the Department of Agriculture's Animal Plant and Health Inspection Service. Before we grant a permit for take or import of a marine mammal for public display, 
the requesting facility must provide information demonstrating that its education and conservation program is based on the professionally recognized standards of the public display community. I will now address the three specific questions raised by the committee. Regarding the adequacy of the professionally recognized standards, the Act stipulates that education and conservation programs offered by public display facilities be based on professionally recognized standards of the public display community. These standards are set by the industry that is being regulated, and Congress did not intend for us to regulate the content of education and conservation programs. Instead, Congress deemed that standards approximating those of the Association of Zoos and Aquariums were acceptable. Following the 1994 amendments, we asked the Association and the Alliance of Marine Mammal Parks and Aquariums to prepare a list of their standards for education and conservation purposes, which we published in the Federal Register as an example of standards that would meet the, the permit requirements of the Act. With regard to the need for governing regulations, our general permitting regulations regarding application submission review and issuance criteria, for example, are applicable to public display permits. As part of the scoping process currently underway, we are focused on clarifying and consolidating existing permitting procedures related to take or import of marine mammals from the wild. While we have not proposed specific regulations for education or conservation programs for public display facilities, we will consider the views of the public throughout the scoping process and during subsequent rulemakings. In terms of evaluating education or conservation programs at public display facilities, our primary consideration when reviewing applications for permits is whether the removal from the wild is sustainable and does not compromise stocks maintenance at optimum sustainable population levels. Applicants requesting a permit to import or take marine mammals from the wild must demonstrate that they meet the three aforementioned criteria. We do not routinely reevaluate the education and conservation programs of facilities holding marine mammals after permit issuance. However, upon receipt of a new public display permit application, we review the education and conservation program of the facility regardless of when we last issued a permit for that facility. Madam Chairwoman, I appreciate the opportunity to be here and look forward to the opportunity to answer questions. I thank you very much, Mr. Schwab, for your interpretation of NOAA's role in captive marine mammal management. Dr. Marino, you are now recognized. Please proceed. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. My name is Lori Marino, and I am a senior lecturer in neuroscience and behavioral biology at Emory University. And I'm also a faculty member in the Center for Ethics there. I want to thank you, Madam Chairwoman, and members of the subcommittee for inviting me to share my professional experience and knowledge on this issue. I've studied dolphin and whale brains, intelligence, and behavior for close to 20 years. And I've published over 40 peer-reviewed scientific papers on this topic. I've also conducted several in-depth analyses of the claims made by the dolphin-assisted therapy industry and the captivity community in general. And I have also been an educator for the past 15 years. The Marine Mammal Protection Act requires that public display facilities provide a program of education that meets professionally recognized standards. To meet even minimum standards for education, two simple criteria should be met. One, the information provided must be accurate. Two, there must be evidence based on valid outcome measures that people are truly being educated when they visit these facilities. So let's address the question of whether either of these criteria are being met. I'll base my testimony on materials from the Alliance of Marine Mammal Parks and Aquariums, SeaWorld, and the Association for Zoos and Aquariums. And these are all referenced in my written testimony. First, let's look at whether the information provided about the animals on display is accurate. We'll focus on the claims made about dolphin and whale brains and intelligence. The captivity community seems to want to have it both ways. On the one hand, it wants you to think that dolphins are intelligent enough to be worth paying money to see. But on the other hand, it downplays that same intelligence so as to allay any ethical concerns about keeping them in captivity. To achieve this, 
The captivity community publishes material that is often false or misleading. Here's a couple of examples. First, regarding the size of the dolphin brain. Now, this is important, guys, because the size of the brain relative to the size of the body is a key indicator of the level of intelligence across species. And dolphin brains, like human brains, are oversized in proportion to their bodies. In fact, dolphin brains are second only to modern human brains in relative size. Their brains are three, four, and five times larger than expected for their body size. But in an attempt to minimize the intelligence of these animals, the Alliance website states that dolphins have proportionately sized brains. This is patently false information. Like us, humans, dolphins have large complex brains, and those large brains mean a keen intelligence. Another example, the Alliance claims that the evidence for complex intelligence in dolphins is untested. This ignores decades of scientific peer-reviewed research showing that many dolphins and whales possess the ability to comprehend a human-based language, are self-aware as we are, and have highly developed cultures. Despite what the captivity community wants you to believe, dolphins and whales possess capacities that are rare in the animal kingdom. These are just two examples of deceptive messaging by the captivity community. There are so many more. But clearly, the basic retirement requirement that information be accurate is not being met. So now onto the question of whether the education claims of the captivity community are based on valid outcome measures. You're, you may hear arguments today by the theme park community that attempt to convince you that the usual standards of academic rigor and evaluation by one's peers are old-fashioned and no longer apply, and that there's a new way of assessing learning, especially informal public learning. But don't you believe it for a second. These are simply veiled attempts to defend research that doesn't even meet minimal professional standards and that is not even peer-reviewed. The bottom line is that good research is based on logic, and that doesn't change. You and I know that 2 plus 2 equals 4. It always did, and it always will. But the captivity community claims that the way to assess learning is by asking visitors what they believe or how they feel. That would be like me giving my students no tests, no assignments, and at the end of the semester asking them, did you have a good time? Did you learn something? And if they all said yes, well, I'd give them all A's. If I did that, I would be out of a job. The basic fact is that the only way to assess learning is by measuring knowledge. And this is something that the captivity community doesn't seem to want to do. In summary, there is little, if any, evidence that any real education is taking place during visits to theme parks. It would have been easy enough at any time in the history of these facilities to design proper research on their educational value. But that research has yet to be done. In my opinion, this is a matter with very serious implications for public education. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Marino, for your views on the need for improved agency oversight of public display facilities. And now I'd like to recognize Dr. Corcoran. Please begin. Thank you, Madam Chairwoman, Ranking Member Brown, and members of the subcommittee. I appreciate being invited here today to speak on what constitutes meaningful public education for marine mammals in captivity. And um, I'm going to concentrate on education rather than conservation, because that's what we've been asked to focus on. And before the, discussing the points that we were asked to address, I'd like to briefly sketch out some ideas on how we perceive animals and how that affects the way we go about managing our interactions with them and, and the historical development of those, and then where that takes us to today. And this categorization that I'm working with is a very simple one. It was put forward by a New Zealand ecologist called uh, Graeme Corley quite some time ago now. Put simply, the way we perceive animals can be divided into four classes. We have nasties that we fear and dislike and usually want to cull, and that by culling I mean reducing the size of their populations in a way to achieve a particular management end. We have lovelies that we like and revere and honour and want to conserve. 
We have commodities that tend to be domesticated animals or wild animals that we hunt. And usually when we're hunting, we try to do that in a sustainable manner. And then we have irrelevancies that animals that people just tend not to think about at all. And I became particularly interested in people's conceptions of marine wildlife during the four years I spent working in Norway. And their attitudes were totally antithetical to those that I'd previously encountered were actually the norm. And it really forced me to ponder why people hold the perceptions that they do. And I found Corley's very simple classification uh, very useful in this case, and I'm using it here to briefly think through the roles of marine mammals in captivity and the role that can have in changing people's perceptions of marine mammals. So in, prior to the 50s, dolphins were basically seen as irrelevancies, although we don't have to go too far back to find a time when they were commodities. People hunted dolphins for food and leather. Killer whales were generally viewed as nasties. From the 50s to the 70s, a number of aquarium zoos um, increased rapidly to meet public demand, particularly through the West. And at the same time, we got a lot better at um, capturing, transporting and maintaining these animals in captivity as we grew in our knowledge and experience of them. If we look at what's, what the situation now, US citizens tend to view dolphins and killer whales as lovelies. People became familiar with dolphins through shows in Aquaria and, and from the television show Flipper, where a trained dolphin, or apparently several trained dolphins, were portrayed as a free-ranging family friend. And with this heightened awareness, people grew to understand that dolphins were intelligent marine mammals, and the public view of killer whales changed radically at around the time they appeared in captivity, which provides some support for the argument that there are situations in which captive animals can work as ambassadors for their species. But note this is historical context here. More recently, we're beginning to understand the true cognitive capacity and complex social lives of bottlenose dolphins and killer whales. And in the case of bottlenose dolphins, this understanding has come from a combination of research on captive and free-ranging animals, whereas from killer whales, almost all of this is from free-ranging animals. The MMPA is about more than cetaceans, and the public perception of pinnipeds is much less straightforward. There's parts of the country where seals are seen as lovelies, and there's other instances where seals are perceived as nasties. With that as background to, specific, to address the specific points raised, with regard to the adequacy of current professionally recognised standards, we're hearing more about this from people who know much more about it than I do. And my understanding is the AZA's accreditation, uh, the current professionally recognised standards, and as a marine ecologist, these seem pretty reasonable to me. And if you look at some of the work by members of the AZA, for instance, the Monterey Bay Aquarium's uh, Seafood Watch program, and it's achieved very high standard of conservation education. It's at least as good as that offered by the Zoo Aquarium anywhere internationally. Perhaps there's a need to aim for this high standard as, uh, in, for all members of the AZA. Um, I'm somewhat more, less comfortable passing comment on the need for regulations as this is a policy issue. Um, but to give an example where it seems that maybe some oversight of the oversight mightn't hurt, there's aspects of the life history of and behaviour of cetaceans that informs arguments against keeping them in captivity. There are instances where the educational information provided by some facilities isn't as good as it could be. And given the place that people trust in members of the AZA, perhaps it's appropriate that there is some oversight of the oversight and in that instance. With regard to evaluating education and conservation, we've just heard some about that from Dr Marino. No doubt we'll hear some more from Dr Boyle. I'd, I'd argue that most of the arguments that are being made is that, uh, that the educational value of, of captive marine mammals is amenable to scientific test and we have the tools in social science to do this and we, and we need to make a better effort at actually doing that. To re return to changes in attitudes, although people now see marine mammals as lovelies, what we're doing in the oceans is not, getting, is not making the oceans any better for them. We see marine mammals as animals to cherish, and it may be that experienced animals in captivity can reinforce this emotion. But there seems to be a disconnect between people loving dolphins and then making the choices they need and making the societal choices to ensure healthier marine environments. And when brought, viewed from this broader perspective, maybe all of us are falling down in um, achieving better public education. And how do we instill and enhance a sea ethic in, in US citizens? That to me seems to be the big question. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Corcoran. Um, I understand you're 
uh, from Australia, and uh, you're a uh, visiting uh, fellow at Cornell. I thank you for your testimony. Uh, our next is uh, Dr. Boyle. Please proceed with your testimony. Chairman Bordayo, Ranking Member Brown, and distinguished members of the subcommittee, thank you for allowing me to testify on this important matter. Only 221 facilities, including SeaWorld, meet AZA's mandatory accreditation standards, which are the most comprehensive and stringent in the world. Today, the opportunity to see and get close to wild animals at zoos and aquariums is one of few authentic experiences that can help stem the tide of Americans' growing disconnect from nature. Our education programs reach 175 million visitors annually, including 50 million children. Since 2000, AZA members formally trained 400,000 teachers in informal education methods and they provide $85 million per year in, in educational support to teachers and schools. I have here letters from our members detailing their education and conservation work, and I ask that they become part of this hearing record. The enormous value of informal education has been conclusively proven by 50 years of research by the National Science Foundation. Recently, the National Academy of Sciences reported, and I quote, that informal environments are of fundamental importance for supporting science learning and improving students' attitudes toward science. New research proves that dolph visitors to dolphin shows experience an increase in conservation-related knowledge, attitudes, and behavioral intentions, and they retain the knowledge gained during the experience. This very month, the renowned scientific journal Nature reported, and I quote again, Education policymakers should take note. Much of what people know about science is learned informally. So to be clear, zoos and aquariums are more effective and more important than ever to science education. The Marine Mammal Protection Act allows permits for public display only to those who offer a program for education or conservation purposes that is based on professionally recognized standards. The National Marine Fisheries Service, as we've heard, formally recognized and published both AZA standards and those of the Alliance of Marine Mammal Parks and Aquariums as the professionally accepted standards which public display facilities much, must follow. Conservation education is mandated by AZA's accreditation standards. They should continue to be the recognized standards because they fulfill both the spirit and the requirement of the law. Recently, the Animal Rights Journal Society and Animals published an attack by Dr. Marino on research led by the world's leading scholar in free choice learning, John Falk. Marino's paper does not meet even the minimum criteria for scholarly ethics or the basic requirements for credible scientific research and is not worthy of consideration. The real experts do not agree with Marino. A current NSF study showed that live animals promote more synthesizing conversations, which helps visitors make sense of the natural world and increase their value for it, than any other form of formal or informal learning experience. In 2009, the National Research Council reported abundant evidence that zoo and aquarium education programs and settings contribute to people's knowledge and interest in science and the involvement of groups historically underrepresented in the sciences. Many such reports show the effectiveness of our education programs and evaluations. That's why we stress that attempting to entrench current evaluation methods in legislation or regulations would restrict rather than support the advancement of ever more precise evaluation tools. Finally, I offer the following recommendations. AZA standards produce effective marine mammal conservation and education programs which fulfill the requirements of the Marine Mammal Protection Act. No changes in law or additional regulations are necessary. AZA and its members welcome the opportunity to work with the Congress and the agencies on making these programs even more successful than they are. We invite you to experience these educational programs for yourself. See what happens to people when they get close to marine mammals. The inspiration, the involvement, and the enduring commitment to conservation generated by these interactions is unquestionable, 
and undeniably important to the future of marine mammals and to our planet. On behalf of the Association of Zoos and Aquariums, I thank you for the opportunity to be here today. I thank you very much, Dr. Boyle, for presenting AZA's perspective on marine mammal captive display and also providing for the committee more information on the professional recognized standards of the industry. I'd also like to um, uh, introduce uh, two members of the subcommittee that have just uh, uh, come in, um, the Honorable Donna Christensen uh, from the Virgin Islands. Thank you. Um, uh, to my colleague for attending this subcommittee meeting, and also uh, uh, Mr. Cassidy from the state of Louisiana. Thank you. Now I have a few questions uh, that I'd like to begin with, um, and these are for um, Mr. Schwab. First of all, for the purposes of all of my questions, please assume that I am speaking about marine mammals under the jurisdiction of your agency, namely whales, seals, sea lions, and dolphins. With that in mind, we are pleased that after 16 years, the NMFS, or NIMFS, will propose a rule to implement the MMPA provisions on public display. Do you know how many facilities in the United States hold marine captivity for the purpose of public display? I have data on the uh, the numbers of animals held in dis in, in in facilities uh, currently uh, at approximately uh, eleven hundred. Uh, Do you have I, the number of the facilities? I don't facilities. know the number of actual facilities. I have staff here that perhaps might, but uh, but uh, uh, and, or I'd be happy to get back to you on that. I, I Dr. Boyle, are you? Um, I, can o I can only speak about AZA accredited facilities, but there are 98 of our member institutions that hold marine mammals. All right. Uh, yes, I'd like to have the total number, so if you could provide that for the committee. So uh, the staff just, uh, just informed me that it is roughly 100, uh, which coincides with uh, the number. 100, all right. Oil. Uh, the second question, in your testimony you state that once a public display facility meets the criteria under the law that requires them, among other things, to offer a program for education or conservation that is based on professionally recognized standards of the public display community, that NMFS has no additional oversight over the holding, the breeding, and the care of the animal, which has been delegated to the USDA. Are you saying then that you have no further responsibility for determining whether the facility is continuing to offer a program for education or conservation based on professionally recognized standards? Madam Chair, that, uh, our focus has been on uh, that initial uh, test that I described. Uh, at that point, then primary oversight of you know, care and welfare of the animals shifts under the Animal Welfare Act to APHIS. Uh, I'm not suggesting that we don't have any further responsibility with respect to so, the continued uh, meeting of that educational test, but that has not been a focus of our right. uh, programmatic activity. So for the record, then, uh, it's a no. Is that correct? Uh, I'd like a yes no, or a no. No, I am not stating that we have no further responsibility with respect to ensuring that the facilities meet that educational requirement over time. Well, then, who is monitoring this? As I said, it's not something that we have provided, uh, that we have focused on from a, from a programmatic perspective when animals are uh, are moved, and we do deal with circumstances where um, animals are transferred from one facility to another, then at that point uh, that test is applied again. Well, I'm, I'm listening to your answer. I think the answer is, uh, I mean, you know, to the question is no. Is this, I mean, it's, it's not, a, it, it's definitely not a yes. So it, it, it's got to be a no. Well, I, I guess I'm, I'm not clear on the, if the question is, um, do we have an active program that 
aggressively monitors the continuing of that education responsibility on a regular basis? The answer is no. If we have a, if, if your yeah, question right. is, do we have the ability to do that, and do we occasionally meet those requests, those responsibilities over time? The answer is yes. Uh, <laughs> All right. Well, that's a very interesting answer. Now, do you agree that under the MMPA, any facility holding a marine mammal for the purposes of public display is required to provide an education or conservation program that is based on the professionally recognized standards of the display community? Yes. All right. And if so, who is monitoring these facilities to ascertain if this is the case? Uh, the, the accrediting organizations. Then how, how can you explain the interpretation of the law? I, I don't. I'm not sure I understand the question, Madam Chairwoman. Well, who, I just want to know who is monitoring this? The, uh, the, the, the content of the, of the education program, we believe, is under the uh, auspices of the accrediting organizations. The fact that an, uh, an education program exists or not, we understand to be our responsibility. Mm -hmm. So in other words, no one is monitoring. If a, if a facility that uh, obtained a, a marine mammal for the purposes of um, and under uh, the tests that I described then ceased to provide that educational, uh, per educational or conservation purpose, mm -hmm. uh, that would be the point at which uh, I would believe we would have the opportunity and the need to re-engage. Mm -hmm. Well, the way I see this, I think we have some problems here. Now, under the law, uh, the NIMPS is required to establish and maintain the Marine Mammal Inventory Report, the only nationwide registry for captive marine mammals held at public display facilities. Now, according to your registry, how many marine mammals are held in captivity in the U.S for the purposes of public display, and how many facilities in total are holding these animals? I think you uh, I mentioned answered that earlier. 1,100 yeah. animals currently, and uh, approximately 100 facilities. 100 facilities, okay. Um, I assume the registry should have a record of every animal held at all of the AZA facilities and all the facilities belonging to the Alliance of Marine Parks and Aquariums, does it? Uh, Yes. It does. All yes. right. Okay. I'll go on to the uh, ranking member now for any questions he may have. Okay. Thank you, Madam Chair, and thank you for the, this good information that you just gave us. Uh, Dr. Ball, I'll just, uh, if we could, just ask you a few questions, and then I'll uh, go to the other members. Dr. Marino criticized the methodology of the multi-year AZA study funded by the National Science Foundation. She concludes there is no compelling evidence to support the notion that zoos and aquariums education programs are effective. Do you agree, or has Dr. Marino proved that your public education programs are ineffective? No, I don't agree at all, and I can give you some reasons for that. Uh, Marino's article criticizes the methods presented in a review article. So review articles don't by definition, present the detailed methods. They're a summary for uh, general use of practitioners. Um, so they ignored the original publication by Falk, which did provide detailed methods, and they failed to seek out the data that could have been obtained through the National Science Foundation uh, that funded the research, and all of the data and original articles are, are available in the public record. And interestingly enough, their article criticizing this review paper did not even cite the original publication. Furthermore, Falk's work is a descriptive study. Their criticism of it, their critique, pretended that it was an experimental design and therefore Marino's entire analysis is based on a flawed assumption. Further, Marino's critique followed Karl Popper's 1959 definition of science which has been thoroughly debunked and discredited in the 1970s as bad science. And then later in, in 1997 and 98, Sokol and Brickmont published a paper called Fashionable Nonsense, 
postmodern intellectual abuse of science. The paper was about how Popper's work basically was used to misuse scientific and mathematical concepts. And finally, Moreno published in a supposedly peer-reviewed journal, but the editors failed to ensure that the substance of Moreno's paper reflected the original research, and they failed to even confirm that Moreno's criticism was actually based on valid science. I'll give Dr. Moreno an opportunity at a later moment, but I got a couple more questions to ask you. How often are the facility, how often are the industry standards updated, and are there other educational standards that facilities are required to meet, and do standards vary in each state? Our standards are written uh, to be performance standards, and they're written in a manner that allows states to uh, meet what we know are going to be regional and local standards, state standards for education that they have to meet. Uh, they're updated on an annual basis. Uh, we look over our standards each year. AZA's full accreditation standards uh, are dated with that year. Uh, and the Accreditation Commission, which is a group of 16 professionals operating as an autonomous body within a AZA, uh, looks at all of our accreditation standards and the education standards are reviewed along with the others. These, these standards require that an institution must ensure that education is a central tenet of the institution's mission. It requires that they develop a written education plan that matches current practices in, in accredited zoos and aquariums and meets local and regional standards. It requires that they have regularly, uh, eval regular evaluations of their education programs to test uh, their accuracy and outcomes. The standards require that an each institution, no matter how small, must have uh, full-time paid staff to overseeing it dedicated to education, and the institutions must have sufficient funding in order to support the education required by our standards. In addition, the, the standards require that the institution adhere to our policy on the presentation of animals, our policy on animal contact with the general public, and our policy on program animals, animals taken out for uh, showing to the direct public. And the following are closely reviewed then each time an institution passes accreditation uh, and, and matched to current practices across the industry, including a review of the number of education staff relative to the visitor base, the presence of a docent program with adequate training of those docents uh, for interpretation, the presence and condition of classrooms, uh, the existence of quality outreach programs and the content of those programs as well, how education messages are conveyed to casual visitors, the quality of education publications, brochures, and other print material that the institution produces, the level of contact with local schools and institutions of higher education, how graphics and exhibits are developed, uh, and more. But I'll stop there. I, th I thank you very, very much for this. And if I could just ask you a general question. Uh, to all the members of the panel, do you feel that we have sufficient regulations in place today, or do we need further regulations to, uh, to uh, you know, I guess uh, because of the problem that existed a while back at, at SeaWorld? I'll speak to the education standards. I feel that there are adequate standards in place, and to uh, Chairwoman Bordayo's question earlier, uh, once an institution, uh, you notice the match between the number of institutions that have marine mammals and those that are accredited by ACA. It's almost a perfect match. W once that institution receives a permit and has marine mammals, our, our, our accreditation standards require conservation education. So, the, so an answer to the question is we're monitoring it. Each institution must go through accreditation every five years. Every five years, it's a clean slate. Starting from ground zero, an institution is reviewed in every part of its operation as to whether or not it's meeting the standards. So it's not a re-accreditation. It's all over again from scratch. Uh, and we feel that we're monitoring it on a, on a daily basis. Our Conservation Education Committee, populated by 20 of the country's leading informal science education professionals, our, our Field Conservation Committee is involved in reviewing content and several, several other of our committees are, are involved in ensuring that the content is accurate 
uh, and presented well and meaningfully to, to visitors. So we're monitoring that in an ongoing way. Now, Dr. Vaughan, do you have a, a, an estimate of the number of jobs that uh, are impacted by zoos and aquariums? I do. Um, nationally, uh, our institutions, our member institutions, so the 221 accredited zoos and aquariums, uh, employ 126,000 people across the country, and they generate approximately $8.4 billion in economic activity in their regions. Thank, thank you so very much. Um, anybody else have an opinion? Do we need to change the regulations? Are, we, do we, are the regulations in place sufficient to, to have oversight of the, uh, the animal parks? Okay. You're over. Mr. Brown, I would just uh, note that from the narrow perspective of uh, focus on conservation and education standards, standards associated with these programs in these facilities, we are uh, comfortable with uh, the current focus on the industry standard um, as the basis for those educational programs. Okay. Thank you very much. I thank the ranking member, and uh, now I'd like to recognize um, a gentleman from Michigan, uh, Mr. Kildee. Uh, thank you, uh, Madam Chair. Um, uh, Dr. Marino, uh, are there any reasons uh, for uh, captivity of marine mammals, and if so, under what conditions and for what purposes? Well, thank you for your question. Uh, are there any reasons for captivity? Well, I think that um, uh, there is a purpose to temporary captivity when an animal is, has stranded and is being really rehabilitated and prepared for release or at least put into um, a sanctuary situation. That is, in my view, the only, uh, the only uh, purpose that captivity could serve. Um, I haven't been given a chance to respond to uh, Dr. Boyle, and with permission, I would like to do so. With my permission. Thank you. Use my uh, it is understandable that um, the authors of that paper, the AZA paper, would be defensive because their paper was not published in a peer-reviewed journal. Ours was. And the journal that he refers to is not an animal rights journal. It is the Journal of Human-Animal Studies, and it was peer-reviewed. But I want to say something um, in particular about his comment that we were attributing uh, causal conclusions to him when he was making, doing simply a, a descriptive study. Let me read to you what uh, AZA President and CEO Jim Maddy asserts about this AZA study. He says that for the first time we have reliable data validating the positive impact zoos and aquariums have in changing visitors' feelings and attitudes about conservation. Positive impact is a phrase about causation. It is not a descriptor. It is a phrase that denotes that zoo and aquarium visits are causing a change in attitude, knowledge, or behavior. We simply took the authors at their word and reviewed the article on that basis. And one thing further, um, the, uh, it's difficult uh, to understand how uh, Dr. Boyle could criticize us for um, using whatever information we could get to analyze the study since it was not available um, for peer evaluation. But we did contact the first author. Uh, Mr. Falk, and he did send us more detailed information on some of the items in the test, so we did have that. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you very much, Dr. Mar Dr. Boyle, how often uh, is the are the facilities reviewed for accreditation? Uh, each institution goes through the complete accreditation process every five years. And how many institutions you said Around 100, was it? 221 accredited institutions. 221, one in Michigan, I believe, right? Uh, yeah. And Saginaw? Yes. Um, with your permission, I, I want to comment on something that was just said. 
Well, since I gave her my time, I'll give you my time. Thank you. Um, it seems that Dr. Marino has some uh, uh, very selective uh, memory uh, and opinion about captivity, since much of her work on uh, animal cognition has benefited from animals in captivity. So her response to you about the reasons for captivity are quite confusing, to say the least. Um, that opinion that she offered here, I would say, uh, is indicative of the article that was just produced in that that article was not science. It's been debunked. It's based on old and outmoded techniques. The article isn't science. It's political science in the worst sense of the term. It's not the word, and we're trying to you know, find facts here. I left my office today with a hundred other things to do. Try to find facts. Now the word debunked has meaning, Paul. Has meaning. But it is surcharged with subject subjectivity, is it not? I mean, when you use the word debunk, is that helping us much? Uh, could you send us a paper on how you arrived at the uh, conclusion? John Falk uh, and his colleagues have written a rebuttal to the article, uh, which I've summarized in my comments. I can make that available to you uh, this afternoon. And he would call that debunking? Yes. Well, uh, in addition, uh, paper in the 1970s and then uh, the one that I cited in 1998, uh, which uh, focuses on uh, the scientific absurdities, Karl Popper's work has been shown to have no meaning in current day science. You know, it's just interesting. I, I, we're very busy people. You're very busy people. You've all done well in your own professions. But now we have debunked, and what was the last word you used? Uh, uh, <laughs> that's right. <laughs> The, the, science, effect, right. the science upon which the paper is based is of the same level of credibility as if I walked in here and told you today that the earth is flat. Mm -hmm. That's pretty condemnatory. Um, well, thank you for your uh, scientific input. Thank you very much. Thank the gentleman uh, from Michigan, uh, Mr. Kildee. And now we'll recognize Mr. Madam Chairman, I don't have any questions this panel. I feel, you know, that I wasn't here in time for their testimony. I'll just listen to the, to the show. I think it's quite entertaining, but go ahead. <laughs> I thank the uh, acting rank ranking member, and now I'd like to recognize Mr. Cassidy from Louisiana. Um, Dr. Marino, um, so I gather from what you just said earlier that unless it is rehabilitation of an injured marine mammal, you would close all the uh, parks, or put it this way, if perhaps an animal were already there and accustomed to captivity and could not survive in the wild, you would keep it open, but otherwise you would not allow news to come in and explain your position, if you will. Well, uh, I mean, I am not in the industry, so I am not uh, in a position to make those decisions. Um, my personal opinion is that um, the an animal that obviously needs to be in captivity uh, should stay in captivity, but certainly it seems to me that that doesn't characterize the vast majority of, of animals in theme parks doing shows. Now, so, so, I, so just so I'm clear what you would advocate, would you advocate uh, increased regulation by the federal government as regards this, or would you advocate no if uh, a, a new uh, if, if, if there's a, a uh, what, what would a young dolphin be called, a baby dolphin? A calf. A calf. If a calf were born, that the calf would be released to the wild? or No, I'm not advocating that at all. We're here to talk about the educational aspects of public display facilities. And my research has shown that there's well, this, very little hang, evidence hang, for that. Hang with me that. You know, I've actually, uh, no one ever believes this because I've got so much gray hair, but I actually have young children. And, and I'm struck, and I'm also a teacher, by the way, and I'm yeah. struck that, that we, two things about assessing learning. One, that there are several stages. So my eight-year-old goes and she sees a dolphin and she now becomes less something she colors, but it becomes something mm -hmm. she sees. Then later when she has a science course, a year later it has more meaning to her 
and it's a building process. So is it really fair to say, okay, you're, you're going to take an exit poll as you walk out, we're going to do a before and after assessment, a pre-post test, and make an assessment as to the validity of the experience as opposed to saying, you know, this is just part of the building block. Well, the, the uh, AZA is making the claim that when they do entry and exit surveys that they have conclusive evidence for public education. I'm not making that claim. I'm agreeing with you. I'm saying that that is not necessarily education or at least the methods that they've used haven't shown that. Um, yeah, certainly it's the case that kids have a good time when they go to zoos and aquariums. People have a good time when they go to casinos in Las no, Vegas. No, but, that but doesn't actually, mean it's educational. There's actually a compelling difference because my children know much more about dolphins than they do about Malaysia. On the other hand, I suspect if they went to Malaysia and they came back and read about it, it would then kind of inform what they had uh, seen. Well, well, yeah, that's your impression, and I have every respect for that. And now, that said, uh, and actually I think that probably pedagogically I could find studies that would support that. I mean, I'm a physician, I work in a medical school, mm -hmm. so I have kind of a sense of how people learn. Yeah. Uh, um, okay, and, and so uh, it isn't so much that you're saying, just so I understand it, that the learning experience isn't valid, rather you're just saying that the way they've sought to document the validity of the learning experience is invalid. I just want to see the evidence, plain and simple. Now, and so if there is no evidence, then you would not see the rationale that there's a learning experience taking place as a rationale for the continuance of the park. Uh, I have to have evidence for um, a conclusion like but, that. I mean, I have to see something that um, no, no, that's not what peer, I asked you. Peer evaluated what I, what standards. What I asked you was, if there is no evidence, would you see a justification for the park's doors to remain open? Um, if the per if the park stores are open because they're claiming that it's an educational experience, then no. No, I can see though that their reason is one is sheer enjoyment. Some people will just go. But that's not what they're claiming. And some will do it because it's learning. Because as we know, there's a bell-shaped curve, and some people walk out with a really unique, fabulous learning experience. Others are unaffected. Mm -hmm. When you measure that across the mean, the one is lost in the other sometimes. Yeah. But, but certainly, just from experience, we know that some kids will be totally jazzed by that. Yeah, that's true, of course. But this is way too serious a situation to really leave to just impression and belief. No, but the seriousness of it is only defined by the consequences. So what would be the consequences if they could not establish on, say, a pre- and post-test uh, whatever, that there have been a meaningful educational process. The consequences are that, for all we know, the public could be misled. Um, there could actually be negative impacts of zoos and aquariums, and we would never know. So wouldn't you want to know if that were the case? Well, you couldn't do a controlled trial. I mean, you were going to take a couple you, states and have no aquariums and a couple states with. No, and then... no that's, that's not what you would do. You would key, you, there are several things that we've outlined in our paper that you could do to make sure that that type of survey um, would be a legitimate scientific survey. Again, I, I think it's very important that kids have a learning experience. Sure. And frankly, intuition tells me what sometimes studies cannot show is that there's going to be some, two, two standard deviations out who become marine biologists because of their yeah. experience, two standard deviations, some unaffected, and for most it's a building block for a greater understanding as is life. Uh, but I also am not quite sure, m m Madam Chairwoman, is the, just so, I'm, uh, just so I'm clear, the whole purpose of this study is merely to establish if there's an educational experience in, a, in an aquarium, not necessarily to establish if there should be increased regulations thereof. Is that correct? Qu yes, ma'am. I'm sorry. Sorry. I, <laughs> I apologize. Um, so the purpose of this study is just to establish whether or not there's an educational value of zoos and aquariums, or at least of aquariums, but not necessarily to establish should there be an increased regulation of the aquariums. Is that correct? It's, it's the education. Okay. Correct. Okay. Thank you. I yield back. Uh, I'd like now to recognize uh, the gentlelady from Virgin Islands, Dr. Christensen. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, uh, Assistant Administrator Schwab. Uh, returning to the question of evaluating education, under, and I know you can't see me, but under the MMPA, um, NIMS can modify, suspend, or revoke a permit if the terms and conditions are violated. Without periodic review of education and conservation programs at public display facilities, how can NIMS assess whether a permit should be modified, suspended, or revoked? How do you even know if the facilities are meeting the requirements of the law? 
Th thank you, Ms. Christensen. So perhaps I could uh, clarify by suggesting that we separate the fact that there exists a program from the substance of the program. Okay. We believe our test is focused on the existence of the program and we have a legitimate continuing role with respect to the uh, insurance of existence of a program. It's the substance of, a pro of the program that we believe uh, by virtue of, uh, you know, the, the, the progression of this issue has been delegated to um, the industry as embodied by the um, two accrediting organizations that we have discussed. And do you believe it should be left there? Uh, or do you believe names should have a, a, a greater role? Uh, as I said a, a few Content. minutes ago, we're, we're comfortable with um, the substance of the educational process being addressed in that fashion, yes. Okay. Well, Dr. Boyle, I had a chance to go through the testimony, even if I didn't hear all of the oral testimony. How do you reconcile the interest and knowledge in the students after interaction at zoos and aquariums that you testified to with the uh, assertion that, the, for example, the aquariums disseminate incorrect information? And to what extent does AZA certify the accuracy of the information? And also, what exactly constitutes conservation education? What, how do you define that? Uh, conservation education is uh, teaching, uh, and that takes many forms. Uh, in an informal environment, uh, to connect people to nature would be the simplest way to say it. We're teaching uh, about animals uh, and their habitats uh, and our relationship to them. And. Um, the, the assertion has been made that some of the information, for example, the size of the brain in a dolphin is, that's disseminated as information is incorrect. How do you... Um, I, that, I, I would not for a second uh, uh, bet that 100 percent of everything that's ever said in zoos and aquariums is entirely accurate. I'll take Dr. Marino's suggestion and we'll look at that. She's an expert in brain function, brain anatomy, and so we'll certainly benefit from that opinion. The overwhelming majority of the content delivered by zoos and aquariums is accurate, and I guess uh, the, the accuracy and the usefulness of that information for pedagogical reasons is uh, sort of voted upon by the hundreds of thousands of teachers who take students to these institutions for those interactions when those teach teachers know they need to meet uh, local and regional uh, accreditation standards and outcomes. Okay, thank you for that answer. Um, Dr. Marino, um, and I'll say this to everyone on the panel, my home district, in my home district of the Virgin Islands, we have Coral World, which is a small aquarium. And it's not only worked with fish and wildlife to restore injured animals to health and then to the wild, but um, it also finds ways to ensure that they, they feel to ensure that visitors have educational and meaningful experiences by, with wildlife by giving people direct interaction with animals, whether fish, turtles, sea lions, etc. Mm -hmm. um, they report an increased respect for wildlife following a visit. And they and other facilities report changing conservation-related behavior in a positive way following visits to these um, facilities. Do you agree that this in itself is a worthwhile outcome? And should that be the goal, just increasing respect for nature and wildlife? Do you think that the aquariums and zoos, as you review their data, meet that? And do you think that they still have an, a duty to educate in your definition of education beyond just increasing awareness and sensitivity? I uh, Thank you. I think that that is a laudable goal. And um, I would like there to be some evidence for that. Right now, there is none. Not even for respect or? Well, I don't know um, how that study was done, so I don't want to pass judgment on it. Um, I'd like to think that there was uh, an authentic change in attitude as a result of visiting the zoo. Um, if you show me how that study was done, then I can at least evaluate it scientifically. Okay, well, thank you, Madam Chair. I don't have any further questions. Thank you, uh, Dr. Christensen. And I have one final question before we go into the second uh, panel. Uh, Dr. Corcoran, Dr. Boyle testified that many animals, especially 
aquatic species cannot be studied in their natural habitat. What we learn from marine mammals in public facilities has, in fact, built our knowledge about their perceptual world, their social needs, their cognitive skills, and virtually all of their basic biology. Now, what do you think about that statement? Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. Um, just before I answer that, I know at the end of my talk, you said um, I was from Australia. I'll just point out I actually became a US citizen a bit under two years ago. So despite the accent, I am an American. Oh. Um, well, we like the accent. <laughs> well, at least you understand it. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you, ma'am. Uh, well, I think that would have been a fair thing to say about 30 years ago, but it's just simply not the case now. There's an awful lot of research that goes on on uh, marine mammals, you know, free-ranging marine mammals, and I'd say the majority of uh, published research on marine mammals over the past decade or so has, been, has come from um, free-ranging animals. To take my own case, um, I've published in the order of 80 refereed papers and at least 70 of them would be based on data collected specifically from free-ranging marine mammals and they address the issues that you're talking about. Well, thank you, thank you very much. Uh, the gentlelady from Virgin Islands wishes to be recognized. She has an, an just, extra just question. Just one question, Dr. Dr. Marino. You spend a fair amount of time in your testimony, your written testimony on stress. Is it possible, are there ways that the stress of captivity can be reduced so that um, these animals can be displayed in an effective way without producing undue stress on the animals, mm. either in zoos or aquariums? Yeah, that's a superb question, and you know, obviously, I'm not in a position to to answer that. I'm not a veterinarian, but I've evaluated the the work that's been done, the peer-reviewed literature on um, the effects of captivity on dolphins, and there's certainly uh, substantial evidence that they undergo stress and harmful effects of it. Um, you know, obviously, to find a solution to that would take a very, very careful, long, thorough analysis. Uh, I thank the uh, witnesses for the first panel for your uh, answering the questions here, and uh, we find it very interesting. I want to thank you all for uh, coming today. And we'd now like to recognize the uh, second panel. Where is the second? First, we have uh, Ms. Julia Scardina, curator, Sea, Park, or sea World Park and Entertainment. Dr. Naomi Rose, Senior Scientist, Humane Society International. Louis C. Hoyas, Executive Director, Oceanic Preservation Society and Director of The Cove. And Dr. L. Ray Stone, President and Partner of Quest Global Management. I would like to welcome our second panel of witnesses and thank them for appearing before the subcommittee. And again, I would note that the red timing light, I don't want to have to repeat myself, but each of you has five minutes. Uh, when the red timing light goes on, you know that your time has concluded. However, we will use your full written statement um, uh, in the record. Before we begin with... Um, uh, the testimonies, I would like to recognize the ranking member for an opening statement that he has uh, for a second panel. Madam Chairman, thank you for having these hearings, and I don't have an opening statement as far as being written, but I have a statement orally. Um, I'm one that believes that the aquariums that our nation's built over the years are very vital for educational purposes. Uh, I believe the Sea Life Centers are very also educational purposes, and I know I listened with interest to the last testimony about who could argue whether it's educational or not. One of the things that we have to recognize as, as human beings is the awareness that can be created in young people and how you do that. Um, this is something that we can't just take lightly because uh, the uh, sea life centers, the aquariums, when you take a young person there, the doctor mentioned it, uh, it's, it enlightens people or gets young people thinking. And not many of you would have an opportunity to go to sea. I noticed with great interest the Australian was just talking in New Zealand 
uh, about how he uh, had at sea or had at wild uh, species to study. And this is true probably for someone, but his education probably started when he was very young and probably in an aquarium or probably somewhere he could observe because whether we like it or not, our population, Madam Chairman, now is basically centered around large cities. We don't have the exposure we have ordinarily in the older days. Uh, and I, I argue that although uh, we have this hearing, whether it's educational or educational, is a matter of definition. If I can encourage one young mind to begin to think, then I've accomplished my goal. Be I a SeaWorld uh, official or be it aquarium official, I've accomplished the goal. They might go on and become great scientists in that arena. And so I don't take this hearing lightly because there are those, and I've read some of the testimony from other interest group, would have no captivity, period. We'll let them run around loose and wild, and only a few of us will enjoy or see or understand, and that would be the privileged. But the mass of people we have nowadays would be unable to be exposed. And so my goal as a, as a, as a person is to make sure that I give an opportunity to young people to see and maybe question. Uh, is this right or wrong, but also get some interest in the species themselves. So I know every time, and I'm an old school teacher, I used to take kids to um, see the captive animals. Uh, may it sound captive. Uh, they did come away with the feeling, some of them, that it was wrong, some of them it right, but most of all, they came away with a sense of curiosity. And to me, curiosity is one of the greatest things that a young man can acquire. So as we go through these hearings, I hope people understand that, that they don't get you know, polarize and say we can't have anything other than to rehabilitate and turn loose. I could tell you a story about turning a wild animal loose one time. He didn't go. And that's very, very embarrassing when they don't leave you and they stay with you. It means you apparently did too good of a job. Some people ask me why we turned the whale loose down in the, the one that had that terrible accident. Well, I very frankly, that might be an idea, but truthfully, that whale probably would not survive. Uh, and some people must think about that, too. Madam Chairman, thank you for having these hearings. They're always encouraging. Thank you very much to our ranking member, Mr. Young from Alaska. Thank you very much for your statement. Uh, now I'd like to recognize the first on the second panel, uh, Ms. Scardina. I thank you for being here today, and I again offer my sincere condolences to you and your colleagues for your loss. Please begin. Thank you, Chairwoman Bordeo. And thank you, Ranking Member Brown, and also members of the committee. On behalf of the thousands of educators, animal care specialists, trainers, and scientists at SeaWorld and the nation's other accredited zoological facilities, I'm really honored to speak with you all today. I started working at SeaWorld more than 30 years ago because I love and care for animals. I was inspired to make animals the centerpiece of my life through experiences I had as a child. I'm from Chicago and I have vivid memories of learning about animals at the Lincoln Park Zoo. That institution touches young people every day, just as I was inspired over 40 years ago. Now I share this because I believe in the power of experience in generating understanding, molding values, and motivating behavior, particularly in young people. My job is to share animals with people in ways that inspire and educate them, I can't put it more simply than that. My travels around the world have allowed me to experience animals, people, and conservation. But those travels have put something into perspective for me. There is a great need to motivate people to act on behalf of wildlife. Forming relationships with animals and then sharing those relationships in ways that convey the animal's beauty, their power, and intelligence has been very gratifying to me. I see the amazement and the fascination on our guest faces. And creating that sense of wonder and passion is SeaWorld's greatest strength. I was invited to speak here today on how meaningful education is at SeaWorld. But it would take me days to share every text and every satellite broadcast, every graphic and every exhibit script. But the essence of education at SeaWorld is something far more memorable than words on a page or images on a DVD. It's about an experience that moves people and motivates change. Now, I could tell you all why manatees are critically endangered, and you might care or you might not. Or you could visit SeaWorld 
and see with your own eyes the terrible injuries they suffer in boat collisions. And I can tell you that the vaquita porpoise will likely be extinct during our lifetime and that the Yangtze River dolphin already is. If you interact with a dolphin at SeaWorld, that experience might inspire you to act. But SeaWorld is more than just inspiration and education. It's direct action. We assist hundreds of animals in need every year. Yesterday, we released several endangered sea turtles back to the wild. And today, we'll release a manatee in her calf. In just the first four months of this year alone, we've rescued more than 1,000 animals. Not long ago, we received a letter. And it was no different than the millions of other letters that we've received throughout our history. And here, judge for yourselves whether this child had an educational experience at SeaWorld. And I quote, the trainers at SeaWorld have inspired my son to become a veterinarian and wildlife photographer. His defining moment came to him during a Shamu show. At that very moment, his life was truly changed forever. And I have a packet of other letters from other children as well. While we are committed to sharing animals with our guests, I'd like to point out that we're better at it today than we were 46 years ago. And if it's better today, it will be better still 46 years from now. SeaWorld is a leader among the nation's marine parks, but we're not perfect. I can promise you, though, that we'll always continue striving to improve. We view this committee, the agencies charged with oversight of zoos and aquariums, and the AZA and the Alliance as partners in that process. I will close with something that has deeply saddened all of us at SeaWorld. As you mentioned, Chairwoman Bordeo, we experienced a profound loss on February 24th. My colleague, Dong Branshaw, drowned after being pulled into the water by a whale. We're certainly reviewing that incident and have pledged to make any changes necessary for the safety of our staff, guests, and animals. Now, I've spent my life doing what Dawn loves so much, and there are very few people who can speak from experience about swimming with killer whales. Few people have seen SeaWorld guests the way we have, though, from in the water with our animals. Dawn herself was passionate about education. She could trace her love of animals to a childhood experience at SeaWorld. She knew that every day that children are educated at SeaWorld in the most meaningful sense of that word. Tomorrow's conservationists are being formed today in zoos and aquariums across the country. I also know that this committee is a, is a powerful voice for our oceans and that you support countless, countless conservation efforts worldwide. And we applaud you for that. The people of SeaWorld and the nation's zoos and aquariums share your passion and commitment to conserve the world we love. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Ms. Gardena, for your uh, testimony. Thank you very much. And now we'll go on to um, uh, Dr. Rose. Thank you for being here, and please proceed. Thank you, Madam Chair and members of the subcommittee for inviting me to testify today. I'm going to try to focus my testimony on, on two things. One is on um, something that Dr. Marino touched on, inaccurate information that is in some uh, materials that are available to the public but also the need for independent review and oversight of these education programs. Because what we've been hearing, and uh, neither Mr. Schwab nor Dr. Boyle um, in their testimony um, said anything to gainsay this, um, we have a lot of self-evaluation and self-regulation going on here. And I do think that that is a, a point of concern. Um, I think the reason this is important, a lot of people have said today that this is important, don't take this lightly, is because millions of people are being exposed to the education at these facilities. And many people, many among those millions, get their education solely from these facilities. Um, they may you know, see a, a, a special on TV or read an article in a magazine, but primarily what they know about marine mammals they're getting from a visit to a theme park. And I think that makes it essential that we have good oversight of what those um, programs say to these people. I think at the moment there is no independent oversight of these uh, programs. Um, as Mr. Schwab testified, um, it's not been a focus, I believe is how he put it, but in fact there are no regulations at all. They've not been promulgated in the 16 years since the 1994 amendments, and that is a serious concern. 
I do not believe it was Congress's intent at the time of the 94 amendments, and I was there, um, to simply remove that oversight. And again, it's not because we don't trust um, the, the commercial display facilities, but the fact is, is that they have a conflict of interest in terms of self-regulation because they are for-profit. I'm talking about the for-profit facilities. And so there has to be oversight if this is the reason why they are being exempted from the take provision, the take prohibition under the Marine Mammal Protection Act. I think it's only in the interest of the American people to have that kind of independent oversight. Um, I do want to touch on a couple of inaccuracies. I'm a killer whale biologist, and so some of the things that are told to people about these animals are of particular concern to me. What I actually find most distressing is there's a great deal of scientific information missing from SeaWorld's educational materials, especially information about killer whale social structure, acoustics, and other aspects of their um, remarkable natural history. It's simply omitted from what people are told because I believe it's not in the best interests of SeaWorld's commercial um, bottom line to tell people this information. So, I mean, however, I'm going to focus on a couple of uh, sins of commission, if you will, rather than omission. I mean, a teacher's guide, SeaWorld states that the typical lifespan of killer whales is probably 25 to 35 years, while in an information book it claims that no one knows how long killer whales live, followed by an observation that scientists believe killer whales in the Pacific Northwest might live at least 35 years, and later this information changes again, a female's life expectancy is 50 years and a male's is 30 years. Conspicuously, SeaWorld never mentions the lifespan of killer whales in captivity. These are all supposedly wild statistics, and is vague about assigning maximum or average to these numbers. In fact, these data are, in some cases, incorrect, and the confusion of offering so many different numbers, I think, is misleading. The best current scientific knowledge, which is the standard that SeaWorld supposedly adheres to, um, on killer whale longevity has determined that the life expectancy of 30 years for males and 50 years for females is an average life expectancy. Maximum estimated life expectancy for males is 50 to 60 years and for females is 80 to 90 years. This is our own lifespans. They match ours. SeaWorld strongly implies that there's still considerable scientific debate about these estimates when in fact the only place the debate continues is within the public display community. These estimates are firmly established firmly established in the marine mammal science community. I would like to point out that 22 killer whales, all but one younger than 25 years of age at death, have died in the past 24 years at SeaWorld facilities. The last death was in 2008 of a very young animal. This information is not available anywhere on their website. Um, the, the regulations that I believe are necessary, these, these concrete, constructive recommendations that I would like to offer the subcommittee, include um, periodic reporting um, on education programs with sufficient information for the agency to determine if the program continues to meet these professionally recognized standards. I'm not talking about content. I'm just saying independent oversight of whether they are meeting those professionally recognized standards. As Mr. Schwab said, it's not a focus of NIMS. Well, it should be a focus of NIMS. They need to promulgate regulations that will include periodic reporting. Also, they should insert into the regulations a provision to have right of inspection because they, they, they then can independently evaluate the programs with eyewitness um, evaluation, with on-site evaluation. These are things that are allowable under the current law. You do not have to change the law to insert these into the regulations, and it would allow the agency to actually um, meet the, the requirements to potentially revoke and seize animals if those requirements are not being met any longer. The law re allows for that, requires that, but without these regulations, it's not possible for NIMS to determine that. So these are the suggestions. I have a number of others that are appended to my testimony um, to help the agency do its job. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Ms. Uh, Scardina, for your thoughtful input. I'm sorry. <laughs> I'm sorry. Thank you, Dr. Rose, for your um, critique. A very interesting uh, testimony that you just gave. And I'm sure the committee will have questions. And now we have um, uh, Mr. Uh, Sahoyas. Uh, please begin with your testimony. Yeah, thank you, Madam Chair and members of the committee for allowing me to talk on this issue. 
Um, I'd like to start out by saying that we're all on the same team here. We like to all think of ourselves as educators, as someone who has dedicated his life to educating the public through photojournalism and documentary film. I wholly appreciate and t take no issue with the value of an informal education for our, for our children. I've been a photographer for National Geographic over the course of 18 years. Most recently, I made a film that won an Academy Award for, fe for Best Feature Documentary. It's called The Cove. The film, in part, is about the largest slaughter of dolphins on the planet. Although the hunt has been going on on a small scale for hundreds of years in a small village, it has escalated recently, and there are now thousands of dolphins brutally killed every year in Taiji, Japan. The hunt is being fueled by the need for dolphins from the captive dolphin industry. For the last five years, as part of my research for the Cove, I visited dolphin shows and aquarium around the world and throughout the U.S. I did not start out with an opinion on dolphin shows, but after getting to know these animals in the wild for the last several decades, I take issue with the circus-type shows that happen at these parks and the way the captive industry likes to portray them, these shows, as education. Never once in the wild have I ever seen a, a dolphin do a double, double flip, spit water, or moonwalk. Professional or amateur divers would never feed or ride on the back of a wild dolphin. They are not performers. These animals are highly social creatures that live in pods from 20 to 2,000 in number much larger groups than I've ever seen in any park setting. Orcas are large dolphins. They have a much larger brain than ours. They have more, more convolutions of the gray matter, allowing for sensory neurons. They're more sensitive than us. They have an extra sense, sonar. They have recently been found to have higher amount of spindle neurons that are associated with complex and advanced emotions. I have seen wild dolphins come to rescue of injured members in the wild. They've come to my own rescue in the wild as well. Since the time of Aristotle and Pliny, these animals have been legendary for saving the lives of humans. Throughout history, dolphins are the only wild animal known to save the life of a human being. Resident orcas are some of the most social creatures on the planet. They stay with their mothers their whole life. These relationships cannot be supplanted by a trainer. They don't need a trainer in the wild. They don't need husbandry and artificial insemination to figure out how to reproduce. They've been, doing, they've been mating for 50 million years without us, without our help. They don't need to learn circus tricks in order to be fed. They do need our help to understand who they are and what their real needs are in the wild. It is irresponsible to those in the captivity industry to compare orcas and portray them as playful pets when it serves the purpose of entertaining an audience, and then compare them to wild predatory animals when they need an explanation for extreme and aberrant behavior. They can't have it both ways. In the history of mankind, there has never, ever been an orca known to kill a single human in the wild. Not one human killed <laughs> ever. But one sea world dolphin, Tilikum, taken from its mother out of the wild at two years of age, has killed three people in its own lifetime. It's a tragedy, but the captive dolphin industry would like to believe it's an unusual behavior. However, two months previous, the day before Christmas, another SeaWorld orca killed another trainer in the Canary Islands. And yet the parks continue to speak out of both sides of their mouths. We teach our children that feeding or harassing animals in the wild is unacceptable. In fact, it's against the law. But when they pay $79 per family member in a dolphinarium, it's now somehow called education. Ray Stone admits in her testimony that Florida has an escalating problem with people feeding and harassing animals in the wild. It should be no coincidence that Florida has the highest population of captive dolphins in the world and the most dolphin shows. The truth is, if our goal is to educate the public, to engender compassion and promote conservation, then we must think seriously about what constitutes, what constitutes education. We do not find it necessary to furnish parks with deserts and tundras in order to explain geography, nor bring dinosaurs back from the dead to explain them. Kids have a natural curiosity about these animals. We hold marine mammals on display simply because we can. The ethics of riding on top of a wild animal in a spandex suit cannot be reconciled under the banner of education or conservation, especially when dolphins and people are getting hurt and killed in the process. Jacques Cousteau said, the educational benefit of watching a dolphin in captivity would be like learning about humanity only by watching a prisoner in solitary confinement. To me, the actions speak, speak louder than words. The main purpose of today's hearing is to decide whether there's a potential ethical conflict of interest when you have an industry self-regulating. I want to enter to the record evidence that members of the Alliance, who are currently involved in setting the educational standards for this industry, were involved in the captive trafficking from Taiji, Japan. And I want to raise the question, given the fact that they were, do you think that these are the same people that should be making these kinds of decisions about education for us? Thank you. Uh, thank you uh, very much, Mr. Uh, Sahoyas, for uh, sharing your experience, and we're very pleased that you're here with us uh, this morning. Uh, uh, Dr. Stone, you're the final uh, witness on our second panel. Would you please proceed? Thank you, Madam Chair, Mr. Brown, and members of the subcommittee. 
for the opportunity to speak here today. I am Ray Stone, a marine mammal veterinarian, co-founder of Dolphin Quest, and past president of the Alliance of Marine Mammal Parks and Aquariums. I received my Doctor of Veterinary Medicine in 1980 and pioneered the application of diagnostic ultrasound in marine mammals. This is my 25th year of caring for dolphins. The Alliance is an international association of 55 marine life parks, aquariums, zoos, research facilities, and professional organizations with over 40 million annual visitors. Collectively, we represent the greatest single body of experience and knowledge about marine mammal education. Annually, we reach more than 2 million children through school programs, summer camps, and other on-site activities, another 800,000 individuals through off-site outreach programs, and 150 million people depend on educational information we provide through our websites, publications, and satellite TV. More than 4 million people have participated in our interactive animal programs. We are strong advocates for NIMF's Protect Wild Dolphins campaign, focusing on the harm caused from feeding or interfering with dolphins in the wild. We helped fund, produce, and distribute an award-winning public service announcement to raise awareness for the cause, along with funding and distributing the agency's watchable wildlife educational folders. I would like to point out to Dr. Marino and Dr. Rose and the subcommittee members that in, 19, in, sorry, in 2009, two doctoral dissertations on education about dolphins in public display met their university's rigorous research and scientific methodology standards, passing their committee's scholarly scrutiny. Using quantitative methodologies, L.J. Miller at the University of Southern Mississippi found both short-term and long-term gains in knowledge, attitudes, and behavioral intentions, and increased reporting of conservation-related behaviors. D.L. Sweeney at the at the University of California found multiple learning outcomes, including knowledge gains for all participants, the construction of meaningful connections, especially to conservation, and increased attitudes and intention to engage in stewardship. A 2005 study by the California Department of Education found that students in outdoor science programs improved their science testing scores by 27 percent. Factoring out other variables, studies of students in California and nationwide show that schools using outdoor classrooms and other forms of experiential education produce significant student gains in social studies, science, language, arts, and math. And while Dr. Marino can question the methodology of individual studies, the National Research Council and the National Science Foundation remain the gold standards. As Dr. Boyle pointed out, their reports in 2008 and 2009 comprehensively established the validity of multiple outcomes for informal learning settings, including zoos and aquariums. There are more details about these studies in my written testimony. The National Science Teachers Association formally recognized the educational value of zoos and aquariums in a 1998 statement on informal science education. Informal education plays an even stronger role in a weak economy. Our Secretary of Education, Arnie Duncan, just last week expressed concern about the possible loss of hundreds of thousands of teaching positions and further cuts to education funding. He acknowledged the importance of private funding and support for our financially strapped education system. Leading educators developed our professional standards almost two decades ago. To be accredited by the Alliance, a park aquarium must pass a rigorous inspection and meet our educational standards every five years. Alliance standards require that members offer the public multiple learning opportunities while visiting member parks and aquariums. These public programs are complemented by formal education programs, teacher training, special needs programs, and community outreach. My written testimony includes many examples of Alliance educational programming. Alliance members have long supported field studies designed to benefit marine mammals in the wild. However, many scientific studies Benefiting wild animals are only possible in controlled aquarium settings. For example, as recently as 2004, there were no normal blood parameters available for newborn dolphins. Because we have established a relationship of trust with our mother dolphins, we were able to safely handle their newborn babies. In fact, the mothers literally brought the babies to us. We were able to collect for the first time morphometrics and blood samples on normal baby dolphins under a month of age. This research has been submitted to the Journal of Aquatic Animal Medicine for publication, but already the data is being used by veterinarians worldwide who are treating stranded baby dolphins. While we can all appreciate the story of scuba diving with dolphins or, it, or other places around the world and traveling to interact with wild dolphins, the vast majority of our visitors will never get to scuba dive or travel to such exotic locations. 
Most American families now live in urban settings, their children increasingly withdrawn into an electronic world. We are losing touch with nature and with the animal world. Zoos and aquariums are vital links to nature and wildlife. Connecting people and animals and fostering conservation behavior never more important as our planet faces increasingly complex environmental challenges. I enjoy watching a nature movie with my children, and we learn from some of them, but I do not want to be that to be the only way they or a whole generation of children learn about our ocean wildlife. My boys are both avid environmentalists, and they will tell you they got their passion for conservation through connection, connecting with live dolphins and whales, not from a nature movie. Involving people of all ages and walks of life with the wonder of live animals and unique experiences that create a connection to nature and a passion to learn more is a perfect recipe for meaningful education. And that is exactly what happens 100,000 times a day at the member facilities of the Alliance of Marine Mammal Parks and Aquariums. Again, thank you for the, providing this forum to share information about the Alliance education programs. Thank you very much for your testimony. And now we're uh, ready for questions for the second panel. And I'd like to begin with um, Dr. Rose, Naomi Rose. In your written state testimony, uh, Dr. Rose, you state that some educational materials are implicitly anti-conservation by painting the ocean as a scary place and captivity as relatively safe. How can the educational materials of the captive display community better celebrate the natural world in a way that encourages children to champion it? Thank you very much for that question. Um, I, I'm going to draw a distinction that may um, get me into trouble down the line, but I'm going to make it now. Um, there are two kinds of facilities when it comes to this sort of um, uh, the, the point you made about how they portray the, the natural world. One is commercial and one is non-commercial. And the commercial facilities have a vested interest. They're basically in competition with nature. Um, I've heard again and again that people cannot go scuba diving or whale watching or dolphin watching. It's inaccessible to the vast majority of people who live in an urban, urban environment. The fact is, is that a lot of people can't afford to go to SeaWorld either. And so, you know, where you're going to go and have your vacation and see animals, you know, natural wildlife, um, they're basically competing with nature. And so there's certain things that they're simply not going to tell people. It's not in their interest to tell people, even though they're supposed to be educational facilities. And along with some of the misinformation that Dr. Marino and I have presented to you um, about in their materials that's simply incorrect or misleading, uh, they don't really have a vested interest in telling you how wonderful nature is either because that's their, comp that's their competitor. And I think that there are more uh, marine mammal scientists who would agree with that statement than anything about welfare or, or other issues that are of great concern to me. They recognize the splendor and the magnificence of nature and what you see in a commercial theme park setting with these animals is not that. It is artificial. It may be, in some ways, equally spectacular. These are very large, very brilliantly colored animals. And when you see them leap high in the air in a SeaWorld show, it's spectacular. But it's not natural. And so when you get entertained by a show that has not one scrap of natural history information in it, the pre-show does, and the signage does, but the show does not. And that's what you came to see. That's what you paid your $79 to see. So when you're in that uh, theme park and you're paying a great deal of money, you want to be entertained. And I just don't want people to be misled that they're also being educated. They're not being told what really happens with these animals in the wild, how they really live. And it's because there's, some, there's, some, there's a vested interest in not telling people about that. So the fact that they portray nature as a scary place, it's full of hazards, both natural and human caused, and yet they equate them. Predators are scary. Well, you know, predators are like, you know, for us, you know, we have all sorts of things that we have to deal with every day. You know, I could step out my front door and get hit by a bus. You know, you basically have to be careful. You have to look both ways before you cross the street. That's what these animals have to do out in the wild. They have a job to do. And it's challenging and it is, it is engrossing. And yes, it has hazards, but that's natural. That's normal. That's nature. And they should be celebrating that instead of telling young kids 
SeaWorld is going to protect you from that. When you get entangled in a net, we'll, we'll disentangle you. And when, you know, you, you just escape the predator, and so you get to go to the next station. That's the game that's in my written testimony. I feel that that is perhaps, I feel very strongly, actually, that young kids get a sense that the animals are safe in SeaWorld, but it's really, really scary out there. I don't think that's a conservation message. I think that's an anti-conservation message, yes. Thank you. Another question, have you found the marine mammal inventory report to be sufficiently accurate, accessible, and current to meet the requirements of the law, and what regulatory changes might improve the utility and accuracy of the marine mammal recovery or inventory report? The marine mammal inventory report is required under the statute. It's a statutory provision, and it is the only, um, as far as I'm aware, and I have a great deal of experience with international public display as well. It's, we are the only country that requires that sort of inventory. And it is, it is a, a boon to us because it allows us to track certain data, particularly survivorship, mortality rates, et cetera. And we also have, you know, as, as Mr. Schwab said, we, we know we have 1,100, 1,200 marine mammals in captivity in the United States. We don't know that for almost any other country because they don't have a marine mammal inventory report. So I see it as an extremely valuable database. However, just as all of what we've heard today is about self-evaluation and self-regulation, it is self-reporting. The, the public display community provides that information to the agency. And if they don't provide it in a timely way, the database starts to degrade. So. I believe it is very important, because it's a statutory provision, a statutory requirement, that regulations be promulgated that, that, that very specifically state how, how, how soon after a change in status the, the, the report must be made. It should be 30 days and no more. If it's transferred, if it's born, if it, if it dies, that status change must be reported within 30 days. Mm -hmm. And then periodically, say every six months to a year, Maybe, you know, that can change. The regulations can be um, adjusted for that. But basically, periodically, they have to do a review of their entire inventory because inaccuracies are constantly um, entering the record. And I will give you a specific example. At the moment, SeaWorld Orlando has a false killer whale in its dolphin theater. That animal is currently not listed in the Marine Mammal Inventory Report. I can tell you it's alive. I saw it on April 5th. It's there. I could not find that animal listed in the Marine Mammal Inventory Report. A periodic evaluation by both the agency and the facility of their records for the previous year or the previous six months could catch those inaccuracies. The fact that there is an animal alive in Orlando, you know, is easy to check. And then that could be corrected at that time in the database. Thank you very much. And uh, I find that very interesting. I'd like now to go on to um, the gentlelady from the Virgin Islands, um, Dr. Christensen. Thank you, Madam Chair. Just a couple of questions. Um, Dr. Rose, um, I had asked Dr. Sh um, Administrator Schwab a question about um, their going back and uh, having some input into the educational content. So is your position, he talked about their responsibility to just ascertain that there was an educational program and not the content. So do I understand your position to be that they need to also have responsibility for reviewing and certifying the content? Thank you very much for that question, because when Mr. Schwab said that, I, I wanted to say something at the time. Um, unfortunately, the law currently does not allow the agency to regulate content. It is professionally recognized standards of the public display community. I do not agree with that, but it is what the law says, and I have to live with it. However, once they establish which professionally recognized standards they are going to meet, it is absolutely within the purview of the agency to determine whether they're doing that. Not the content, but whether those standards that the industry itself is going to choose are being met. Outside, independent evaluation of that, I think, is essential. Because again, what we've been hearing today from all the other industry representatives is self-evaluation. And that is, that is not sufficient, in my opinion. Thank you. And I'm sure the chair lady had a little practice with, with your name, um, Mrs. Sahoyos. Um, but, and so is your position uh, that the manner of interaction needs to have some um, review as well, the, the ways in which humans and animals interact and 
Yeah, absolutely. I mean, uh, the, the captive dolphin industry likes to say it presents them, uh, the public, with an authentic experience. There's nothing authentic about a, a dolphin show, the, the, uh, starting with the environment. The only thing that, that uh, a concrete pool has in, in common with the ocean is that uh, they both have water in it. You know, you, you, don't see nothing, you don't see anything about the actual behavior of the animal. I mean, I, I, res I respect, uh, um, you know, J Julie Scardina's, um, you know, opinion that it, it, uh, we need an authentic experience, but there's nothing authentic about the animal behavior of these animals in captivity. A dolphin show, I mean, on, on one hand, you have really good laws saying don't, don't jump on these, the backs of these animals, don't feed them. And then you have on, in the ex exact opposite experience with education, you can do exactly that, but you have to pay for it. And it's, you know, it's not $79 per person. People go with whole families. You're talking about several hundred dollars to go to a SeaWorld show. I did it myself. And my experience was that uh, it denigrates the animal and it denigrates human beings. When you come away thinking that that's what, you, that that's what these animals are, a circus act, um, you know, the, the dolphin's the only animal in the zoo that has to do tricks for its food. You don't do it to, to gorillas. You don't do it to giraffes. You don't, you know, you don't do it to elephants. Um, I, I think we need to reevaluate what qualifies as education. And you know, by the way, I think AZA and the Alliance does some really great conservation work. You know, bringing out animals out of the wild. Some of the great research that's done. That's fine. I don't have an issue with that. I have an issue personally with these shows, these circus shows, uh, being masquerading as as entertainment. I, I think that's just uh, that's education, but it's bad education. Okay. Um. Just one last question. Ms. Gardena, um, there was a lot of discussion back and forth um, on the AZA study, uh, which Dr. Marino had criticized, but it looked at adult visitors. Can you just tell us, and I know this was referred to also by Dr. Rose, but could you talk a little bit about SeaWorld's efforts to educate children? And Absolutely, I can. Um, and also, could you define for me what SeaWorld, um, how do you define meaningful public education? How, excuse me, how we define it? Yes. Yes. And, and then what, what do you do with children? Sure. Well, certainly from an educational standpoint, um, we have thousands of publications and things that have come out, many of which I have brought here just as a sample with us today, um, most of them geared towards children, trying to uh, make sure that they're getting a well-rounded and at least uh, informational experience from that standpoint. We also have content certainly online through our website. And to talk about peer-reviewed uh, and also other information that comes out from the people who actually work at SeaWorld, we have 66 pages which lists research and papers that have been given. So, you know, uh, back to what types of education and, and how we define it is, is basically making sure that we are putting out the highest standards of available information that not only our scientists and our educators uh, find out and, and research, but also outside researchers through AZA and the Alliance, as well as people in the scientific community. Basically, the greatest um, and most in-depth experience that there is on conservation and education in the world, if you were to put it all together. Uh, for children specifically, uh, not only, like I said, is the information in written form and in visual form, but I think the most powerful form is when they come to the parks and they are inspired by what they see. And this is no in, unimportant matter. Children sit in a classroom and they learn a lot. And yet it's not until they go and they experience those things and they get to touch and see and feel. It's why people want to go to museums. It's why people stand outside of the Supreme Court and want to go inside. They want to feel it. They're inspired by what they see. And with all due respect to Mr. Sahoyos, Talking about authenticity, you know, what you see there is the capabilities of these animals. Why do we have the Olympics? Because people get to the greatest height of what they can do, and we love watching that. Well, our animals have been trained to do some of these things that they are capable of. We can't train them to fly because they can't fly, but we can train them to do all these magnificent things that people are inspired by. 
And if you doubt that, if you doubt that we actually inspire people and educate people, please, I invite you all to come to SeaWorld and come experience what we have to offer. If you've never been there, certainly, I think um, it would be worth your while to come and, and be shown around. I'll take you personally. There is so much that people get inspired and enthused and excited by, especially the children. Um, if I have a, a minute left, I'd like to respond to some of the things that uh, Dr. Rose said. Is that the chair? I don't object. Thank you. She, Thank you very much. She wanted to have an extra minute to, to respond, Madam. Yes, go ahead. Go ahead. Thank you. You know, um, Dr. Rose talks about nature being a place where there are only natural dangers. And if that were the case, we really wouldn't have too much of a need for additional education. But that hasn't been the case for many, many years. Natural dangers have been what wildlife has lived with throughout prehistoric history. Animals are, are uh, adapted towards being able to live through the, the types of dangers that they come up against. But you add humans into the mix and all the changes that humans have made over the last couple of hundred years. And that's why we have so many endangered and threatened animals right now. Humans have caused illegal wildlife trade, which is stripping the animals from our forests and from our oceans. Humans have overfished the oceans. Humans have caused habitat loss and habitat degradation. There's pollution in the oceans that is greater than it has been at any time, certainly throughout history. And to say that we shouldn't inspire people to care enough to change their behavior to make sure that we take care of the oceans, uh, it just doesn't make a whole lot of sense to me. And one last point, she talks about us in our efforts as we uh, show off these animals and, and, and inspire people within our parks that at the same time we're making money. And certainly that money is put back into conservation uh, in many ways, 50 million um, to conservation and, and many of the other programs that we've got besides our rescue and rehab programs. But I would like to point out that HSUS makes money when they prove, when they try to convince people that, that we're the bad guys and that there's nothing going on outside in the world, then they want people to give money to them. So just remember that it's not Dr. Rose coming from a purely unbiased standpoint and that uh, we're the bad guys here. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, I'm going to allow um, a response from Dr. Rose, but before that, I'd like to call on um, my colleague, uh, Ms. Shea Porter, uh, for any questions she may have. Thank you, and thank you all for being here. I have to confess that, uh, you know, I too took my children to SeaWorld and enjoyed many, many aspects of it. I've also taken my children to zoos, and I, I think that in the right setting, it can add to the experience. So I'm going to start with saying that, but, but I am concerned about what the right experience really is. And I have listened closely to the testimony, and it's, I'm very conflicted about all of this. First of all, I can't understand how, how there could be three deaths and still consider that educational for children who will now know the history and possibly see something. I, it's not acceptable. I also don't understand how animals can be rented out. And I read that sometimes they're rented out, and that doesn't seem educational. That seems party-like. You know, rent, rent a moon bounce, rent a dolphin. And so I don't know if that's true or not, but, but it's quite disturbing because it doesn't fit into the educational context. So I guess what I'm asking here, and I would ask each one of you to answer for me, please, is there some kind of common ground here? Is there some way that we can show these animals, these glorious animals, in a setting that does not have them entertaining for their food? Because I agree that's outrageous. That's not natural behavior. And it, and it really doesn't educate children, I think, when you show that they can throw a ball off their nose. But I think there's a lot for them to actually see. And I do believe that because we are so removed from the natural environment, many children will not have families that will take them, will not show them anything, but they 
could have an opportunity to recognize something very glorious and real. So where's, where's the middle ground here? Is there any? Okay, and I, I think in fairness, I'm just going to start left to right so everybody will have a chance. So if, if you would, please. Thank you. Those are some very excellent questions that you bring up. Um, to start at the beginning, and I might miss some of the parts of your question as we go, so you may have to restate them, but um, when, you, when you spoke about the deaths, uh, certainly we are all still in mourning of, of Don, my colleague, um, but we have been working with animals for 46 years, and what probably makes this such a high-profile situation right now is, is its rarity. We have a very safe record of working with killer whales for over 44 years of but that Not to interrupt, years. but it's hard for me. I could understand if there was one, but it's hard to me understand how you can still hang on to the educational component when there's three. Okay, well, thank you for that clarification as well. I would love to talk about that. Um, the, the first two deaths that actually occurred um, were when people jumped or fell into the water with the whale. So you've got a situation where the whale is not certainly implicated in any type of uh, behavior which initially caused that. Now those, those people, one of the persons was a homeless person, came in and trespassed okay. on the I night. I, I don't mean to interrupt, but I only have like five minutes here. Okay. But, but the point that I'm making is, regardless of what the story is there, that, that at some point the the reason for the whale being there ceases to exist, it seems to me, and that this is not any longer an educational. And I am not knocking anybody here because, like I indicated, I have been there and I think that, you know, overall there are some very good things, but I just have concerns about that. Uh, okay, and then as far as the um, renting out of animals, I'm not exactly sure what you were referring to, but we do. Uh, through AZA accredited facilities, loan animals, and that is part of our uh, ongoing breeding, very successful breeding programs, which allows us to not have collected any animals over the past 20 years. And so that, that loaning program is, is um, worldwide and, and a very well-managed program that helps us manage our animals. Okay. And do you know where they go and do you follow up on what happens to these mammals after they leave you? I mean, are you certain that their facilities are that, appropriate and are you doing spot checks? I mean, what's your responsibility once you Yes, once absolutely. You um, that is part of the permitting process for, for any facility that they go to to have to meet the same standards as it would be here in the and United States. And you check? States. You yes. go and you physically check during the... Um, during I, the I can't say that we, uh, that I certainly personally have not been to, to all the different facilities, but we have um, either people or representatives that know what those facilities that are and have seen them. Up. Yes. Okay. Dr. Rose? I think your point is very well made that um, perhaps there are some things that just don't, aren't appropriate. It's not that we should just throw the baby out with the bathwater and say no public display, but there are some forms of public display that may be not that educational or even counter-educational. And in, we might even go further than that and say perhaps there are some species that don't belong in captivity. And I'm not trying to play favorites here, but I am a killer whale biologist and I've always felt that the public display of killer whales is highly problematic. They are very large, very social, very long-lived animals and they're being held in circumstances that is really quite um, uh, different than what is in nature and in fact, uh, the, as I testified, um, their lifespans uh, are affected by that. So I think that might be just a, a fact that perhaps this species is not appropriate for, for public display. And in terms of, you know, uh, Mr. Sohoyos testified that there has been no documented case of a killer whale ever killing a person in nature, but four people have died, not three, four people have died in captivity. And one of those persons was a trainer in the Canary Islands and the animal that killed him was a former SeaWorld animal that was on loan. And um, I appreciate uh, Ms. Cardina's uh, testi testimony that, you know, they check. I think they did. Um, they did send a representative over there. Um, I think um, there were SeaWorld employees at that facility for some time um, after those four animals were sent there, but somebody died. And 
within three years of being of being of those animals being sent there, which is um, pretty rapid compared to um, 11 years between Tilikum's previous incident and this one. So I'm I'm wondering what went on in the Canary Islands and whether SeaWorld could tell us what went on in the Canary Islands that resulted in such one injury, by the way, in 2007 and one death in 2009. So um, again, I'm going to make a a, a, a proposition or or, or suggest something that I might regret later, but basically perhaps that we should say there are some species that don't belong in public display facilities. Cetaceans in general are amongst the only species that are maintained in circumstances under public display where there's almost nothing natural about their exhibit. You can put a giraffe in, an, an, in a, you know, a safari park where basically they're out in nature. You can uh, put uh, branches and dirt and you know foliage in a in a reptile cage. You can even put in a, a saltwater aquarium. A lot of things like you know algae and whatnot that give the uh, fish inside the impression that they're in nature. But you can't do that for cetaceans, as Mr. Sohoy has pointed out. There's nothing natural about a seawold enclosure except there's water in it. So perhaps we can um, sort of raise this discussion and this debate to a more surgical um, suggestion. Again, I'm not saying shut them all down. I'm not even saying send all the, sea, the orcas out into the wild. I'm saying phase them out. To, to point out that uh, there's also, also dolphins being dying here too. When they do these shows, there's been numerous in, uh, instances where the, the dolphins collide and die and get hurt as well. So, I mean, the welfare of the animals themselves are being jeopardized, not just the trainers. Um, I think all dolphin circus shows should be phased out. I think the, the educational benefit is clear. There is none. It show, it, it's bad education. Um, I'm not a scientist. Um, I, you know, I'm, a, I'm a more of a naturalist. I, I see these animals out in the wild. I, that's where I think the most authentic experience is. Now you say, you know, inner city kids can't have that experience. Well, I've been to SeaWorld and I can barely afford it. Um, you can go out and see these animals in, uh, in Naples, Florida, and see them in, you know, in, in a, their natural habitat. And that, I see kids getting and charged up in, in, an in a real authentic experience. You know? And then uh, in, in nature, the dolphin dictates the terms of the encounter. Uh, in, in SeaWorld, I don't want to just name to SeaWorld, but all the dolphin aquariums, these are, they have to do, they have to in interact with people with it, because they need to be fed. Uh, the, these animals are, Subjugated, you know. I think when you t personally, when I, th I think when you take, you know, an animal out of the wild, and you train it to do stupid tricks for our amusement, it says more about our intelligence than it does theirs. Um, anyway, I, I, I would like to see, you know, some, somebody else would have to decide how to deal with animals in captivity. I just personally would love to see, the, you know, have, have humans evolve to the point that we don't have to see them doing tricks for our amusement anymore. Right, we're beyond that. Our kids are beyond that. We, that's, it's bad education. I would like to see us all learn from uh, the deaths of the trainers and go back and reevaluate how many of these animals have been killed uh, doing dolphin shows. There's no education involved at all in a, in a dolphin circus show. Thank you. Want me to yield back? May, may I? So, my turn. <laughs> okay. Hello. Thank you. Yes, may I continue? Yes, uh, again, I'm Dr. Stone with Dolphin Quest and the Alliance of Remo Parks and Aquariums. And I appreciate the discussion and the lively debate here. I think Mr. Sahoya said it best uh, in the beginning of his comments that um, we have a lot in common as well. I think we need to reach out and look for ways to educate the public on lots of different levels. Uh, my boys and I are all scuba divers. We've been to the Great Barrier Reef. We've seen whales in the wild and dolphins in the wild many times. And yet again, my boys will tell you that to get in an interactive program with a dolphin in one of our interactive experiences is a powerful and moving connection with the animal and with the nature that that animal depends upon. The need is so great, the extreme environmental degradation that we're facing really implor implores us all to look for ways to reach out to children. Some will be through nature shows, nature film, some will be through uh, books, classroom learning, and some will be through interactive, hands-on experiences with dolphin and whales and being able to see the living, breathing animal in an aquatic environment. Uh, to speak to the, the, the quality of the environment that we provide our animals, um, I've been in um, working with marine mammals for 25 years and I've seen a tremendous evolution in our 
care of the animals, in the quality of the environment that's provided, in the enriching environment that our animals um, enjoy. Um, many of our facilities, including mine in Hawaii, are natural coastal environments with fish in the environment. Um, our animals enjoy enriching social relationships. Um, Mr. Sohoya spoke about dolphin pods being from 20 to 2,000. That doesn't occur with Atlantic bottlenose dolphin that's in uh, coastal waters. Those are generally fluid vision type relationships and smaller pod sizes. And we work very hard to provide social relationships and, and opportunities for our animals that are enriching and beneficial to the animals. I can also tell you that um, while there are some on the panel that have very specific feelings about animals in captivity um, and others that, that uh, feel very strongly about the benefit, looking to the third party uh, assessment of our educational programs is really quite profound. I have papers from the, Nas the National Research Council, um, their report on learning science and informal environments, um, the National Science Teachers Association, the National Science Foundation's 2008 paper, Framework on Evaluating Impacts of Inpo Informal Science Education Projects, and these comprehensively establish the validity of zoos and aquariums and the conservation message as well as the Okay, I, I appreciate that. The moment that. that we're giving them. And I have to say that I, I believe each one of you has an important perspective here. I appreciate your being here today. This is difficult. I hope we do find the common ground. Thank you. I yield back. Thank you. I thank my colleague. Um, I have uh, some final questions. Uh, the first one is for Mr. Sohoyas. At the end of your testimony, you raised concerns that some marine mammals used in captive display in the United States at one time came from Japan, dolphin, a Japan Dolphin Drive. Can you expand uh, on that uh, concern as it relates to the question of developing uh, education programs? Yeah, well, the, the, the dolphin drives are perhaps the most brutal animal hunt in the world. You know, thousands, you know, tens of thousands are killed every year in Japan this way. Um, the captive dolphin industry has previously purchased a lot of dolphins. I, I entered this into the testimony of, um, uh, you know, uh, Ray Stone's colleague, Dr. Jay Sweeney, has uh, invited a lot of these dolphins from the Taiji Dolphin Hunt into, into American facilities. Um, these, to, to me, the ethics of doing that are very much in question. You know, how can, at the same cove where you're taking the survivors, you're witnessing the rest of the pod get slaughtered, every last one of them. What you're witnessing at, when the, at these, these are the surviving members are now are, are put into to captivity. And if you know this is going on, what's going on is they're, they're, this, 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 this activity, the, uh, the captive dolphin industry is actually paying for the, this brutal slaughter. That motivates these dolphin hunters to go out and get these, these hunters. I, I've seen these hunters on the, on the shores of this national park, this Japanese national park. They're like cheering when they get a pot of dolphins. And they're, not, they're not cheering because they're gonna get $600 for a dead dolphin when they sell it for meat. They're cheering because they have 30 dolphin trainers from around the world waiting to pay up to 50 to 100 or $200,000 for a trained dolphin. So I know right now we're all on the same page here about trying to stop the drive hunts. But that's only because the Marine Mammal Protection Act made it, uh, made it illegal for them to now bring it into the, these animals into the country. But now to have these same people from the Alliance now advising this committee okay. on what the educational benefits of having a dolphin in captivity when they've been involved in, in sponsoring the largest slaughter of dolphins in the world, I just want to call into question the ethics of that. Thank you. Uh, may I respond? I have, uh, um, may I respond, please? Yes, uh, go ahead. Uh, I do have another question for all of you. So, yes, go ahead. Thank you. Um, Mr. Sahoyas's uh, accusations there are, are very, very misleading. Um, first of all, we received a handful of these animals over 20 years ago when the dry fishery was occurring. It's a cultural thing. It continues today. And even in the movie that Mr. Sahoyas made, at the end, he, they state that this occurs because of the culture of the Japanese, first of all, first and foremost. They tried to buy the whole group of dolphins. They themselves tried to buy the whole group of dolphins from the fishermen, and they wouldn't be bought because they, 
think that they're pests and, um, and they destroy them because they're competition for their resources. So the movie already discredits the fact that he's saying that the captive industry today even supports it. And he even knows that it is illegal to bring them into the United States. So that handful of animals that we rescued over 20 years ago were obtained at the same exact uh, moment when they were being killed and slaughtered, we were able to get a few out at that point. When we realized, certainly, that they were now going to charge more for those animals, we never went back. We saved the ones that we could, and we did not want to support that drive then, and we do not support that drive now. I just want to make sure we're clear on that. Thank you. Thank you for clarifying the point. Um, my colleague, uh, Mrs. Shea Porter, touched on this point. What educational benefits have been demonstrated to result from shows where trainers swim with killer whales in the water? We'll start with you. Mm -hmm. We've been working with killer whales, like I said, for over 44 years. Two million interactions with those animals. There's been 500 million people who have come to the parks and learned about killer whales through our shows. Dr. Rose even acknowledges that it was public display that made the difference in the attitudes of people when killer whales were reviled and shot at even by our own Navy. And it was the public display community that made that difference and turned people's attitudes around. I think we've heard that uh, oh, a couple times today. Yeah, all right, uh, thank you. Let me, let me just ask you, point blank on the same question. Well, given how dangerous this can be, are the risks outweighed by the benefits? Well, again, I really have to go back to, I've swum with killer whales thousands of times. I've been in the water with killer whales thousands of times. When you take the number of times that we've been in the water and out of the water with these whales, and you look at the amount of risk that then is, that's kind of like saying, well, we shouldn't drive cars or fly in airplanes well, because every so often there is an accident. So would, would the answer be yes? You, you feel that the risks outweigh the benefits? I do, yes. Yes, all right. Oh, I'm sorry, uh, yes, okay. <laughs> the I'm benefits sorry. outweigh the risks, I'm the, sorry. The benefits outweigh the risks. That's yes. correct, yes. Thank you. Um, <laughs> all right. Is, um, the next, the same question. I've heard several times now um, in the media uh, responses to the Tilikum, um, uh, the accident with Tilikum and Don Brancho that um, they've had millions of interactions with these animals that have been safe and it was just a handful that have proven fatal. Um, that's the wrong statistic. There have been less than 200 killer whales held in captivity over the years in the past 44 years, as Ms. Cardina points out. Um, and of those fewer than 200 killer whales that have been held in captivity, two dozen or so, two dozen individuals, not just Tilikum and not just Quito, the whale that killed Alexis Martinez in the Canary Islands, but uh, two dozen different animals have injured or, in the case of Tilikum and Quito, killed their trainers. That's the t statistic to use. That's more than a 10% accident rate. If um, a can opener, a brand of can opener had that kind of accident rate, it'd be pulled from the shelves. It's not that we drive, you know, uh, z uh, many, many times before an accident occurs that is the correct statistics. It's how many cars have been driven that have been involved in accidents. And Congress has just had a series of oversight hearings on the Toyota situation, you know. That was a serious problem because there were actual you know, a, an actual type of car was, was causing accidents. Mm -hmm. There's an actual kind of species held in captivity that's causing accidents. And a very small number of them have been causing, a very small number and a subset of that have been call, causing accidents, percentage-wise, a very high number. So I think the risks absolutely do not outweigh the benefits. All right, thank you. Uh, next, um, Excuse we have me. Uh, Dr. Sohoyas. Excuse me, I'm, I think I missed a turn. <laughs> If I may respond to Dr. So or sorry, Mr. Sohoya's comments about the dry fisheries, I didn't have a, a chance to respond to that question or that statement. Go ahead, go ahead. Thank you very much. Uh, because the statement was made in reference to my colleague and to um, uh, aquariums and parks in this country, I think it's very important 
that we address the issue of accuracy of information. This has been a big point made in our educational programming, the content of our educational message. And I would call upon the film industry to um, respond to the same query for accuracy in their documentaries and accuracy in the information that's being presented. Uh, Mr. O'Berry, who was featured in this film, knew very well that dolphins had not come into this country in over 20 years from the dry fisheries, and yet the maps portrayed on the film specifically had red arrows going all to Canada, the U.S., and Europe. And there was no doubt in the mind of the producers and the, the, the directors of this film that that was an inaccuracy, and it uh, was used to portray and represent their opposition to marine mammals in public display. And I think that was unfair and it should be recalled. Uh, uh, thank you. Um, we'll go back to Dr. Sahayas now. Um, uh, I want to ask that same question again. Um, well, you think I, the risks first of... First of all, I'm not a doctor, but I just... Uh, oh, I'm sorry. Uh, <laughs> full disclosure. Well, it's always better to promote than to demote. <laughs> <laughs> so can, do you feel that the benefits are outweighed by the risks? Oh, I, I don't think there's any benefit at all to watching a, a, a circus show um, at all. Um, and I, I guess I would ask um, uh, Ms. Stone that, uh, have, Dr. Stone, um, <laughs> have, have, have dolphins from Taiji ever gone to your facility? Never. Never? You sure on that? I'm absolutely sure. Okay. Has, uh, is, is Dr. Sweeney a colleague of yours? Dr. Sweeney is a colleague of mine. Excuse me. You're in business with him, right? Dr. Sweeney is a colleague of mine, and I will tell you that Dr. Sweeney is one of the most passionate conservationists that you will ever meet. He is an educator of su supreme experience and talent, and he has dedicated more time to the conservation of wild dolphins than most people you will have met. Uh, he has donated time and resources to Moat Marine Lab's uh, wild dolphin study for over 25 years, and I think that to disrespect him is uncalled for in this setting. Yeah, no, uh, no, no disrespect. Well, also. the witnesses, uh, I think I'll ask the questions sorry. henceforth. Uh, Dr. Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> I, I like Mr. Sahoyas, continue. Um, yeah, well, the, Dr. Sweeney is also known as one of the biggest dolphin traffickers, the previous dolphin traffickers in the world. So, I mean, I, can, I know how uh, uh, people can have two, two, uh, two different points of view, but he's also been the, the subject of another documentary called Fall from Freedom, which uh, presents a, a very similar attitude to the, to, that the Cove has. And by the way, everybody, you know, we brought copies for the movie so you can see it. You know, the, the, best, the best compliment this movie ever had was uh, Frederick Briand from the IWC, a, a delegate from Monaco. He said, the Cove is worth a thousand speeches. So please see the movie. It's Thank available you. on DVD. We have them here. I hope you can, you can see it. And uh, our final uh, witness, your answer to the question? Um, benefits and risks. Yes. Uh, thank you. Um, benefits and risks versus um, having uh, dolphins, and particularly whales, in public display and in interactive programming. I think the benefits far outweigh the risks. I'm also an equestrian. I ride horses. Um, I think horseback injuries and deaths in this country far outweigh any, any type of injuries with killer whales or dolphins. And yet my love of horses and my love of the sport far outweighs any risk of, um, of that type of interaction. And I think the trainers at SeaWorld will tell you the same thing. Um, they're aware of the risk of interacting with large um, predatory animals and they make that choice in an informed and passionate um, reason because they're dedicated to the education and the conservation of the species. Thank you very much to all of you. Now, I, I have probably the $64,000 question to uh, round out this public hearing, and that is a question to you, uh, Ms. Gardenia. What is going to happen to Tilikum? Many people are wondering. And thank you for asking that question. That's a uh, very good thing to be able to state that we are definitely committed to caring for that animal for the rest of his life. He didn't do anything wrong. We are caring for him in his social pod that he knows with the people that he knows with the excellent care that he receives. Will he still be performing? Well, right now we are in the middle of a review of the incident. 
and when that is concluded, we will be able to make uh, those findings known. Mm -hmm. I'd like to uh, ask the others how they feel about, about this. Um, if I can beg your indulgence, Madam Chair, um, Ms. Gardena said a number of things about my position earlier, and you did say that you would come back to me to respond. I just wanted to um, ask for that time. Um, in terms of what should happen to telecom, um, I, again, I'm a killer whale biologist, and I, I spent hundreds of hours on the water watching these animals and their social interactions, and in fact, I specialized in male behavior. So um, the fact that uh, he is currently um, not being touched because they are keeping the trainers back to a safe distance. They are using a fire hose to stimulate him, um, tactile stimulation. Um, he is, of course, being allowed to interact with the other whales in the complex, and that's good for his mental health. But he must know something is different, and perhaps even that something is wrong, because he is not being touched by his trainers. And that is something that these animals by virtue of the fact that they're in public display facilities, by virtue of the fact that they're captive, have come to rely on. The, the trainers become their social partners. And for them to have backed off and not to be touching him and interacting with him in the way that he has been previously must be very confusing to him at the very least and potentially very um, depressing for him. And I'm not trying to be anthropomorphic. These animals are intelligent, they're social, they can feel things like depression. And your dog can feel things like depression, so I'm not trying to be unrealistic here. And I think that um, for uh, SeaWorld to sort of consider just sort of business as usual and, and try to come up with these substitutes for actually interacting with them directly, um, and absolutely refusing to consider the option of, of providing him with a more stimulating environment, and by that I mean a sea pen in, in natural water, in, in natural habitat, and I'm not talking about releasing him, because let's face it, he's a dangerous animal. I mean, he might approach people and, and who knows what would happen. So I'm saying keeping him safe and keeping people safe in an enclosure, but a much bigger one, in natural habitat, on a coastal uh, 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 location somewhere, you know, where he would have so much more room and so much more going on, and that would make his handlers safer. Because frank, frankly, at the moment, you know, they're, they're keeping a good safe distance back. You know, he is, he, he's become scary. And I, I, I totally appreciate the efforts that SeaWorld is making to try to come up with these substitutes like the fire hose. But again, just as a killer whale biologist, I'm telling you, that's not adequate. And again, I would like to beg your indulgence at some point to get my time. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Sohoyas. Um, has, has anybody ever seen uh, a dolphin, uh, a killer whale tank from the air and look at the proportion of the tank to the size of the whale? Very small, right? It's incredibly small. It, it's like, you know, the size of this room. Uh, it's, you know, this is a pretty nice room. We could get room service delivered here, a pizza. We'd all be pretty happy, but and we, we had the choice to leave. These animals don't. They're, they're confined here. And, uh, you know, when you see, like, this aquarium and the, and the relationship to the size of the animal, it's a tank, it's, it's, it's an embarrassment. When I first went there on the ground, I, I thought, okay, there must be some enclosure somewhere that this animal's escaping to where it gets to, you know, to run free. It's just here for the show. I realized when I flew over with a helicopter, that's its environment. I mean, this, says, this speaks so much to humanity that, um, that our lack of compassion that these animals are, are, are so limited that we see that these animals only are the way they can serve us for the entertainment business. Um, I really... It's quite, just question, when you go home from this, this meeting today, just question the value of, of subjugating these animals for entertainment. It, it doesn't make any sense to me. I, I, I agree that we need to see these animals out in the, you know, out in the wild as, as much as possible, but you're going to see, see a much more authentic experience if you watch a, a nature film. You know, you pay $4 to rent a nature film. I did some of the most popular stories of, in magazines, in National, Geographic, National Geographic magazine's history. And they were, the four of them were on, um, on dinosaurs. People have never, you know, kids have never seen a live di uh, dinosaur ever. But, you know, the, the, our interest doesn't wane because we can't touch them and ride on their backs. I mean, I can appreciate uh, Julie Scardina's, you know, I'd love to go see the, you know, the Supreme Court, but I don't need to, to, jump, to jump on a justice's back and make a, you know, a few tricks for dead fish to appreciate it. Um, we can see these, these animals and people in, in their natural environments, but there's nothing natural about a dolphin park. Thank you, Doctor. Uh, and, or, I'm sorry. I want to make you a doctor before the end of this. Uh, Dr. Stone. Thank you. 
Um, I appreciate, first of all, the compassion and the expertise that SeaWorld is providing to the care of Telecom and to the rest of their, their killer whales. Um, Mr. Sahoyas and Dr. Rose are certainly entitled to their opinions and their perspectives on killer whales in public display, but the vast majority of the public and scientists also appreciate the incredible amount of information, the science, the research, and the commitment to, co to conservation that is made possible by the display of marine mammals and killer whales are included. As I said earlier, we're continuing to improve the quality of the environment that we provide the animals, and we're continuing to learn about them, and that will only continue to get better and better as the time goes on. Time to respond to what? Uh, thank you very much, uh, Dr. Stone. Um, Dr. Rose, you wanted to... Uh, Thank you very much. I yes. just would like to respond to what yes. Julie Scardina said earlier. Um, I think she misunderstood me. Um, she said that um, I had said something along the lines of, you know, there are only natural hazards in the wild, and I never said that. Of course, I work on marine mammal protection advocacy. Several members of the subcommittee and their staff are very familiar with me and my organization. We work on things like fisheries bycatch, whaling issues, um, and uh, marine noise and other uh, um, human impacts on the marine environment, and we are very active in those areas internationally and domestically. So I, I did not say that. I think that was a misunderstanding. What I would like to say, however, is that um, something that Dr. Corcoran said in his testimony, he mentioned the fact that, you know, the world is um, becoming a, a degraded place. We are facing, you know, one of the largest extinctions in you know, geological history, we are facing climate change, we are facing, um, you know, ocean acidification and other profound, profound changes to the marine environment, many of which are human caused or human um, uh, augmented. And I think the, the self-congratulatory tone of the public display representatives at this hearing um, are discordant with that. I'm not actually even um, exempting my community, the, uh, the environmental and animal protection community from this, we're missing the boat. We're not educating people adequately to change their behavior and to wake up and recognize how serious the situation is and how much their individual behavior matters and counts and how much they still must do to protect the environment. So um, to be perfectly blunt, as somebody who works um, in regulatory and legislative endeavors around the world to try to protect these animals, I don't see this great education that is occurring apparently at these facilities. In fact, um, I'll give you an example. The United Kingdom has one of the most staunchly conservation-oriented uh, publics. You know, they are uh, strongly anti-whaling. They are very, uh, in, they, they are an island nation. They take very seriously the fact that they must protect the marine environment. And there are no marine mammal parks left in the UK. So clearly they're getting their marine education, their marine ethic from some other source. It is not that they don't have aquariums or zoos. They absolutely do. And that gets back to um, this point. Uh, I'm sorry, Ms. Ms. Shea uh, Porter. Um, um, your point about um, there might be different flavors of, of education or different types of public display that, that we might come to common ground on. I mean, basically, I feel that you know the, the, this issue of circus acts, of theme parks with Marine mammals, large marine mammals that really don't do well, they don't thrive in captivity, is something we should all reconsider. Mm -hmm. They are not necessary, despite what you've heard today, they are clearly not necessary to adequately educate the public. There are countries with little or no marine mammal public display, and they are, in fact, in many ways, doing better than the United States in terms of their ethic. Thank you very much, Dr. Rose. Um, I know we could go on here. Uh, <laughs> for a long period of time, you know, uh, commenting with each other. But um, if you have anything that you would like written into the statement, you certainly can provide it to the committee. Uh, I think we've had a very uh, uh, thought-provoking discussion here today without a question, and I thank everyone for sharing uh, your thoughts with us. I want to thank the panel and all of the witnesses, also the uh, witnesses for the first panel, and your participation in the hearing today. Members of the subcommittee may have some additional questions for the witnesses, 
and uh, we will ask you to respond to those in writing. And in addition, again, if you would like to make further statements, please uh, put them in writing and, and give them to the uh, committee. In addition, the hearing record will be open for 10 days for anyone who would like to submit additional information uh, for the record. If there is no further business before the subcommittee, the chairwoman thanks the members of, for their participation here this morning. And the subcommittee now stands adjourned. Yesterday, the head of Federal Mine Safety told the congressional panel that his agency may start going to court to close mines that repeatedly violate safety rules. That hearing's next. The Senate gavels back in this morning and continues.